as well. Welcome, hey, Don. Thank you. Hi, Don. Yeah, welcome. This is great. Thanks for joining. Oh, absolutely. I've been trying to get the Slack to work, but it's not um, it's not working for some reason. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, I downloaded the app. I confirmed my email address. It sends me an email. I click on the link. It says you need to open the app. I open the app, and it says that didn't quite work. Do you have a computer available to you that you might, maybe it's like a, comp a, a phone issue? Well, I can't, I don't think I have permissions to install the software on our work computer. That makes sense. So I, I was just trying to work around it via, yeah, via. Let's see, to, you know. I can invite you. Well, that's a good idea, yeah. Let's see, I'm, I might be over promising on what I can do technologically, but let's try it. Don, do you do you and Tim know each other? I don't believe we do. Oh, great. Hi, Hi Don. Tim Schultz, Lundberg Family Farms. Nice to meet you, Tim. I know we, outside I'm Don Trouble with Art at Mills, I, I know we do some work with you guys um, via Andy and Naturals and Sergio and that group out there, so. Yeah. Don, I just sent you an invitation to Slack. This might be uh, duplicating your efforts, um, but maybe that will work some magic for you. Ooh, I, uh, this might be good because it's like, what team do you want to be on? Let me see if I can, this works. We are also live on YouTube, so feel free to share that link now. Oh, share the YouTube link, excellent. Yes. Yep. Amy, what is the tiny URL for YouTube Room One, if you know that off the top of your head? I, I don't have it right in front of me. I don't think I know that off the top of my head. Okay, I'll go to our website. Yay, oh. Don, you joined. Yeah, I got in there. That's awesome. <laughs> great. That's what I, I just great. needed a team. I needed a team to be on. Tim, would that be helpful if I sent that to you as well? Looks like you're muted. You, you sent me a link. I just uh, not as adept as at multitasking as others are. So I know. Uh, I am definitely that is probably my biggest weakness. So having one screen open at a time is helpful for me. So Rachel, just to confirm, so will we watch the videos next? and then answer questions is that right yep yep so don we'll start with your video i'll do a general introduction for the session live and then we'll move to your recorded video and then after that we'll have um i believe quite a bit of time for questions at least 10 minutes um depending on how the introduction goes maybe a little bit more um and then we'll move to tim and bryce's talk after that and play their their talk and then do their questions if we have um, extra time at the end, um, we can sort of do a freestyle too and um, resolve any additional questions for you, Don. So we'll see what happens. Um, we have had a little bit of extra time, which has been great um, so that we can engage with people live. Okay. Um, so your, your heavy lifting is over. I told Tim he's off the, off the hook for the most part um, during, during the talk. Um, so you can sit back and relax and enjoy your own, your own presentation. Well, nobody likes to hear their own voice. At least I don't like to hear their typically. So, I, you know, it's one of those. I'm there with you. <laughs> um, okay. Sorry, Tim. So, so, so just, I guess, one thing from a timing perspective then. So my yeah. talk, which is right around half an hour, then about 10 minutes for questions, then go into to Bryce and Tim's talk. So right. when will the, I guess, the kind of the closing Q&A need wrap up? We will I'm gonna quickly, I'm gonna quickly interrupt yeah. here. I think what we decided is that we're just gonna move into each 
uh, talk consecutively, and then we're gonna do questions at the end, just because we're functioning out of YouTube this time. Okay, yep, that sounds good, Julianne. Um, you can, yeah, that sounds great for me. Um, so we'll make sure to do that all at the end. Um, but so Don, that would mean that we'll be concluding the session at around 11, for, by 11.40 at the latest. Um, so you'll be completely off the hook by then to, to go on with your, with your day. Okay. And then to confirm, we will be starting at 10.05. Okay, sounds great. Um, and Sonia will be joining us in this room for translation? Correct, is she there yet? Um, I'm, I'm here, see. I'm here, I'm here. Yay. Hi, Sonia. Hi, how are you doing, Rachel? Doing great. How are you, Sonia? Oh, you probably already answered that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Good, <laughs> well, thank I'm, you. I'm glad you're home and glad that you can be here. Thank you, me too. I'm glad I'm home. And how long, so Tim and Bryce's talk, how long is that? If we're gonna um, go back and back. Yeah, um, his, theirs will be about 20 minutes. Okay. And yours is about 30 minutes um, in yeah. total. Okay. Just trying to figure out if I need to run to the, we don't need to be live at this point though, like if I need to run to the restroom or anything. Mm -hmm. Yep, so you'll be, yeah, you can move around and keep yourself muted throughout the talks. Um, so you actually will only really need to be um, sitting down and talking with other people uh, starting at, I guess that would be, uh, I guess 11, 10 or so. Sorry if I'm getting, um, my time shifted a little bit, but um, yeah. So then from 11.10 to 11.30, we'll be doing questions live. Don and Tim, you can also monitor the Q and A's as they come in, if there are any questions that come in during. Oh, good. Time, if you wanna check them out, you can look at them then too. That's that's those are the questions we'll go off of um, to start with and then move to slack after that if if there's any extra we couldn't address but. Um, and, and that's in the Q&A tab right. Yes. All right, real quick. Um, can we get tech on letting in Bryce from the waiting room. And Tim, I finally found the YouTube live link. It was very really clearly displayed on our website. I just got distracted. Um, so that'll be coming into your email if you'd like to share it. Thank you.
All right, we are a minute away. Okay, muy bien. En un minuto vamos a estar empezando. Please review these tips that we have a successful session. Por favor, um, revisen estos consejos eh, técnicos que tenemos para todos los participantes. All right, and I'm going to hand this session over to Rachel. Muy bien, y entonces voy a um, darle la bienvenida aquí para empezar a Rachel. Thank you so much, Julian. Muchísimas gracias, Julian. Welcome everyone to the Farm to Market session. Uh, bienvenidos todos a esta sesión eh, llamada de la granja al mercado. My name is Rachel Breslauer, and I'm a PhD student in the Sustainable Seed Systems Lab at Washington State University. Mi nombre es Rachel Breslauer, y soy um, un estudiante de doctorado en el Laboratorio de Investigación uh, para el Sostenimiento y Mejoramiento de las Semillas. As you all may know, Bringing novel crops to consumers requires innovation in harvesting, processing, and marketing. Como ustedes saben, eh, llevarle un producto agrícola al consumidor significa eh, trabajo eh, tanto en la siembra como en la investigación, eh, en la planta y en la producción. This session will feature voices from businesses that are leading the way to bring quinoa from producers to consumers. Esta sesión uh, le va a dar un espacio a um, las personas que trabajan en este proceso de llevar eh, la quinoa desde la granja hasta el mercado. Don Troba leads the go to market team for the annex. Don Trova es un líder en llevar a, al mercado este producto um, para the annex. Which is the specialty ingredient division of Ardent Mills. El cual es un uh, ingrediente especial en la compañía Ardent Mills. Bryce Lundberg and Tim Schultz of Lundberg Family Farms. Brace Lambert and Tim Schultz, the um, La Finca o La Hacienda, me recuerdas por favor? What is the name of, of the? Of Lundberg Family Farms. Oh, of Lundberg uh, Family Farms uh, or de la, de la Finca de la Familia Lundberg. Uh, they will discuss how they are revolutionizing the way they bring quinoa to consumers. Ellos nos van a contar cómo es que están revolucionando o se, se están innovando en la forma en que nos llevan la quinoa al mercado. I want to express my gratitude to Don, Bryce, and Tim for being a part of this symposium today. Quiero agradecer inmensamente a Don, Tim, y Bryce por estar aquí con nosotros presentando hoy. We will now introduce our first speaker, Don Troba, and now Julianne will share his video with us. Entonces, vamos a empezar por presentarles nuestro primer presentador, Don Troba, y Julianne va a empezar por mostrarnos su presentación en video. Julian will have to share the um, audio for this video. Julian está um, arreglando los problemas con el audio que tenemos, um, pero ya en unos momentos el video estará con ustedes.
Welcome everyone to the Farm to Market session. My name is Rachel Breslauer and I'm a grad student uh, in the Sustainable Seed Systems Lab at WSU. Um, and I'll also be your facilitator for today's session. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce our speaker, Don Troba. Uh, Don Troba leads the go to market. Uh, I'm gonna restart because I didn't wanna say your division incorrectly. Welcome everyone to the Farm to Market session. My name is Rachel Breslauer and I'm a graduate student in the Washington State University Sustainable Seed Systems Lab. And I'll be your facilitator for today's session. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Don Troba. Uh, Don Troba leads Go to Market for the Annex by Ardent, Ardent Mills. Ardent Mills Specialty Ingredient Division, which is responsible for sales and marketing of ancient and heirloom grains, gluten free ingredients, pulses, and other new product innovations. Previously, he managed marketing for Ardent, Ardent Mills core flour business, Ultra Grain, Whole Wheat Flour, with emphasis on the food service channel. He joined Ardent Mills from ConAgra Mills, where he helped launch Ultra Grain, Susta Grain, High Fiber Barley, and a portfolio of aging grains. Don began his career in food by working on many accounts at ad agencies, including Anderson Parton Partners, FCB, and Bazell and Jacobs. He received his Bachelor of Journalism and Advertising from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln and an MBA from Bellevue University. Without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to Don. Welcome. Thank you, Rachel. It's great to be here. And it sounds so much more impressive when somebody reads it off. Uh, it's great to have that. So, and it's wonderful to be a part of the International Quinoa Research Symposium this year coming to you virtually. I'm extremely excited to be talking with everyone today about some different market trends that we see going on with quinoa. So once again, welcome, bienvenidos to all of our friends uh, across the uh, Spanish speaking parts of the world and uh, look forward to this and answering any questions you might have at the end. So buckle up. Um, I know you paid for the whole seat, but you're only gonna need the edge. Okay, so before I get going, I'm going to go over a few different things today. First, I'm going to tell you a brief a little bit, a brief amount of information about Ardent Mills. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how we look at the world in terms of what we call our drivers of innovation. Then I'm going to share some, some perceptions about quinoa as it relates to consumers and some research that we've done jointly with Cargill. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening with quinoa and CPG and food service. And then at the end, again, like I mentioned, we'll have some time for questions. So briefly, Ardent Mills, we always like to talk about our vision and values. And when you look at our vision, it talks about us that we are the trusted partner in nurturing our customers, consumers, and communities through innovative and nutritious grain-based solutions. And the way we do that is through our values, which are trust, serving, simplicity, and safety. And one of the reasons we're really excited about Quinoa is that we see it being part of a nutritious grain-based solution that we can help deliver and it ultimately supports our mission, which is to enhance the quality of life and standard of health. Ardent Mills is a coast-to-coast -coast company of more than 35 mills. We have mixing facilities, we have a bakery, and we're proud to say that we now have the premier quinoa processing plant in the U.S. in Yuba City, where we recently acquired substantially all of the assets uh, of Andean Naturals, and then many of the members of the Andean Naturals team now came to be part of Ardent Mills. So we're extremely excited about that and proud to have a footprint across the US, in Canada, and in Puerto Rico. I am part of a team within Ardent Mills called the Annex. In the Annex, we like to talk about exploration and, and different types of foods and bringing ingredients to market. We really think about plant and specialty grain ingredients, and then we apply those in a number of different ways, whether that's mixes, or finished breads, but it's really about thinking of, um, through what's next. And at the end of the day, we see quinoa as being a big part of that. And again, that's part of our purpose in being the annex by Ardent Mills. So one of the first things we like to do when we talk about trends is we like to set the stage with what we call our drivers of innovation. These sit at a very high level in terms of how they're influencing food today. And what we've actually seen is that even during COVID-19, these have maintained their importance to a large degree, and some have actually grown even stronger. So I won't go into a tremendous amount of detail, but suffice to say, we spoke and met with a number of different food product developers, influencers, 
leaders across the food space and interviewed them. We didn't tell them what we were asking about. We just wanted to see what was really driving trends today. And through that distillation process, we identified these five key themes, and that's own your health, a wholesome story, eating for good, modern traditions, and convenience without compromise. Now, own your health, own your health is the idea that people want to make their own decisions about the foods they eat and about their health decisions, health choices, and how those interact. They're really looking to the people that they trust, whether that's an expert or friends that they follow on social media or other influencers. The wholesome story is all about getting to where grains or ingredients or anything else might come from. It's about not just knowing specifically maybe the farm where it came from, but what about the farm, the farmer and that person's family? What are they like? How are they treating the land? How are they treating animals? Eating for good is that is this notion that we don't just want to eat things that are good for our body, but that are good for the planet in some way. And you've seen this through lots of different foods. It could be related to the environment. It could be related to helping to fight poverty or malnutrition. Modern traditions is the idea that things that were done in the past have a very comforting appeal today. And by leveraging those traditions, we can, we can not only connect with the past, but also uh, improve upon them as we go forward. And then convenience without compromise is the idea that even though we're in a busy on the go lifestyle, maybe a little bit less so today, but um, typically we're very busy, we're on the go. Um, we don't want to compromise or sacrifice those things that are really important to us. Things like owning our health, a wholesome story, eating for good, or modern traditions. So at a high level at Ardent Mills in the Annex, we like to look at the world through these drivers of innovation. And what's great about quinoa is that it ties extremely well into each of these. And you can probably think through that and you're going to see a lot of that, I would imagine, at the, at the symposium this year. So that's the first thing I wanted to talk about is our drivers of innovation. And I think that's the first point is that quinoa is a very, very strong component of the mega trends that are affecting today. Next, I wanna tell you about some fantastic work that we were able to partner with Cargill with. Cargill, which is a joint venture owner of Ardent Mills, uh, has for several years produced some research that they call the Ingredient Tracker. And it's really focused on what's going on in ingredient labels and how consumers think about those. It's a broad amount of work. And what it does is it looks at more than 200 ingredients. And in fact, in 2020, we assessed over 230 ingredients that consumers might encounter on a food product label. And you can see they range from everything like grains and animal proteins to fats and oils to sweeteners and salts. So it's really looking at a number of different things and it's very comprehensive research. Although it's focused on the US, you can see that we, it's nationally representative. We talked to more than 10,000 people to survey them about these different ingredients. You can see that the breakout is that about 70% were female and 30% were male. Um, typically, the, it, what was asked is, are you the food buyer in the household? And that's what drove that number, even though the population doesn't necessarily mirror that. But it's a broad span of incomes, a number of different generations. We looked at ethnicities. But in general, it's very broad research, and it is quite comprehensive, and it's representative of the U.S. as a whole. The other great thing about this work is that we're able to look at a number of different psychographic segments. So, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit more as it relates to quinoa, but those include clean label seekers. And I think you understand what that might mean. People who are willing to pay more specifically for healthier options, social influencers, which are people who are active on social media and sharing their opinions about foods. And you can see, I often make comments or suggestions about the helpfulness of food or beverages on media. And then the last psychographic group is the group of sustainability seekers. So they want to, to source things that are social, um, that are produced in a social, socially acceptable and environmentally sustainable way. And the first thing that we like to talk about or at least that I like to talk about with our ingredient tracker is that we look at both health perception and purchase impact. And when you look at health perception, and I'll pull that up right now, um, it, it's this notion that um, it's really driving um, 
decisions by people who want to pay a premium for food. So the healthier the ingredient, the more that people are willing to pay. And in fact, what we see is that 41% of consumers uh, are more, are extremely, are very likely to pay 10% or more for food or beverage products with healthier ingredient options. And when we look at all of those 230 ingredients that we, um, that we researched, and I've circled it here for you, you actually see on the left, the top 20 that are perceived to be good for you and the bottom 20 that are perceived to be bad for you. And when you look at those that are good for you, what do you notice? Lo and behold, quinoa is number seven on that list. And that's out of all those 231 ingredients that we surveyed. Now, what's surprising about this to me is that not only is it in the top 20, but it's also the highest rated grain in terms of health perception. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, that is a way to drive more um, from a, a, many people are willing to pay more for ingredients that are perceived as healthy. So this is a very, very strong sign that quinoa has achieved something that's really not been seen among ingredients for a long time. And you can see it's paired with many popular common ingredients today. Now, this, the, the second part of that, and although they're strongly correlated, is we looked at purchase impact. So again, consumers are looking at the back of an ingredient or ingredient statement, and, and then we're talking to them about how, how much does this influence their willingness to buy that particular item. Now, it's not number seven, but it's still in the top 20. And you can see quinoa right there uh, at 30% positive purchase impact on an ingredient statement. So that's really, it's quite amazing that quinoa is, the, is in many ways the little grain that could. It's, it's been, you know, 2013 was the year of quinoa. It's been on an upward trajectory. And, and I think the fact that when we talk to consumers, it has such a strong health perception and such strong purchase impact should be really encouraging to those of us at this conference and to food companies and product developers and farmers and everybody who's involved with quinoa. Um, it's very encouraging for the future. Now, what's even more interesting is that when you look at some of those psychographic segments, you can see that quinoa has an even greater impact. So this first one here looks at, um, at clean label seekers. So again, these are people who are looking for simple ingredient statements. And you can see that quinoa over indexes for people who are clean label seekers. So the general population, very strong purchase impact at 30%, but for a clean label seeker, it's at 51%. Now, what happens with sustainability seekers? Although it's not quite as high, it still has a, a significant amount of impact on people who are thinking about sustainability in their purchases. So you can see 30% for the general population and 15% for sustainability seekers. Again, it's very interesting to see that quinoa has such a strong impact on people. Now, let's take a look at those who are willing to pay a premium for ingredients. Quinoa is very similar to the, to the last two slides. 30% for the general population, as I've mentioned, but 47% for people who are willing to pay more for healthier ingredients. And the last group, and this is also, I think, very important and something for many of us to think about, especially uh, those of us who are involved with social media or who are, are getting a word out about quinoa, is that quinoa among social influencers has a particularly high impact. It's in the, the top group where it's statistically significant. 30% for the general population, 51% for social influencers. And that's really one of the higher scores in there among that group. So as you can see that quinoa has a very strong impact for all of those social um, or the psychographic groups that we looked at as part of the ingredient tracker research. Now, one of the things that, um, that I thought about when I was putting this, this presentation together is where might there be opportunities? This slide shows you the purchase impact among some different generations. You can see on the left, we have Gen Z, Gen Y, Gen X, and then uh, on the far right, we have the boomer group. And one of the things that I noticed is that um, you look at ingredients with stars, they are in multiple segments, but not all of them. Well, in, and you can see the percentage of purchase impact among these different demographics. I've circled quinoa for you. So for Gen Y, it's 36% impact. For Gen X, it's 32. For boomers, it's, it's still in the top 20, it's at 26% but it doesn't show up in Gen Z. Now you'll see a little bit later on, 
that Gen Z is interested um, and have tried quinoa a fair amount, but it doesn't necessarily rate in terms of their top, top 20 ingredients from a purchase impact perspective. So there could be an opportunity to continue to talk to Gen Z about the benefits uh, of quinoa and getting them to look for it actively. Another item that I noticed when I was looking through our work is that when the seeking of quinoa as an ingredient differs for those with young kids as opposed to those with older kids. So on the left, you can see we've got a chart that talks about kids who are 12 and under. And on the right, we have families that have kids 13 and older. So this is from a family perspective. And what you see is that on the right, in the top 20 ingredients, 39% um, purchase impact for quinoa with those older children in the household. And on the left, it doesn't show up. So again, it's not that it's not important to kids 12 and under, but to me, it suggests that maybe there's some opportunities for us from an innovation perspective for those families with kids 12 and under. What are some unique and, and different ways that we can use quinoa that will be appealing to kids? I know I have several kids of my own and uh, we've begun eating a lot more quinoa, but it took a little bit to get them used to that. So that's it for the ingredient tracker. And, and that's, that's really great work that we've done. And I think the big takeaway is, again, quinoa has made tremendous inroads and is, is um, extremely important, I think, in terms of its health perception, its purchase impact. And, you know, we used to joke many years ago that it was a grain that was very hard to pronounce and people didn't know how to say it but they certainly know how to say it nowadays. So now I want to pivot a little bit and talk about what we're seeing at CPG and food service. Now, a lot of this work um, is, comes from Mintel. I also have some work from Data Central, but the bulk of it is from Mintel and we use them for a number of different pieces. So they, they, they helped with this presentation and I wanna give them credit for that and I thank that team for their assistance. So let's talk at first what are consumers saying about quinoa as it relates to CPG type items? So Mintel looks at new product introductions in, in uh, grocery stores and retail out environments. And they've done a number of different questions before. Um, this one comes from a survey of 2000 uh, consumers. And it's really looking at the context of plant-based proteins, asking the question, what have you eaten as a plant-based protein or are interested in buying. And you can see quinoa on the left, a majority of consumers are already eat it or would be interested in trying quinoa. So if you add that up about 66%. There is a group though that, that hasn't um, shown interest. Uh, they don't currently eat it, they don't currently buy it. And so again, opportunity to communicate those benefits. But for those who are interested or who already eat it, consume more and make it a regular part of their diet. The next slide talks about um, the same information, but as it relates to Canada. And what we see in Canada is that there's actually a higher percentage of the population, the Canadian population, that's consuming quinoa actively. So 43%. In the U.S. it was 36% and 30% who are interested. In Canada, 43% have consumed it and 29% are interested. So uh, for the Canadians, great job with the, with the quinoa. We have some work to do to catch up to you. Now, if you remember back in the, in the, um, when I was talking about our purchase impact and health perceptions in, their, in the ingredient tracker, I said there was an opportunity with, with uh, Gen Z. Well, and what we see here is that when you ask people what have they eaten at home in the past month, uh, among a number of different ingredients, um, and this is looking specifically at quinoa, you can see that the highest was among millennials. The second highest is among Gen Z. So they're definitely familiar with it. They're definitely eating it, but they don't necessarily rank it in their top 20. Again, it's not that they don't think it's healthy, but it's not making it into that top 20 from a purchase impact perspective. But it could say that they're just, it's so common to them. It's an everyday thing and, and it's more of an expectation. So again, very interesting when you look, ac look across uh, generations, but I think the other exciting thing is you think about millennials, many of them are parents. And so if they're the ones having quinoa, they now have kids that are coming up and growing up and that's an opportunity to introduce this amazing food to them as well. 
As we look across the globe over the last several years, um, we actually see that the, the total number of products with quinoa in them has increased. So what this chart is looking at is the number of new product introductions. It could be a reformulation or even a packaging change each year for the last five years in these different areas, Europe, North America, Latin America, and Asia, Asia Pacific, and then Middle East and Africa. And as you can tell, the total number of uh, product introductions has gone up on average. In Europe, it went up quite a bit uh, and then came down, but still last year, 703 introductions as opposed to 445 five years ago. And in North America, which is really the only outlier here, it's at 439 and then 437. So it's basically flat. But again, the general trend is people are using quinoa and introducing it more and more. And now I want to pivot and talk about where, what are some of those products that are being introduced and, and what, what is driving some of the innovation and interest in it today? Well, one of the things that we see is that consumers are interested in real, whole, and clean foods that really power plant-based meals. Again, think back to those drivers of innovation. Um, people want to see things. They want to know where their foods come from. They want to have confidence in it. And um, two items that I think are really interesting, and I encourage everybody to Google these when they're done, are Lundberg Family Farms, which I know will be presenting at this year's symposium. They recently introduced the Lundberg Grainspiration Beans and Greens Rice and Quinoa Bowl. And even Green Giant has introduced, introduced harvest protein bowls uh, that contain um, a number of different ingredients and uh, fruits, vegetables, and quinoa. So quinoa, again, a real whole and clean food that can help elevate plant-based meals. That same concept, also um, drives interest in foods that might be perceived to be uh, better for people than their processed alternatives. Uh, recently, Kraft Heinz introduced a line of items called their Amazing Grains Fusion Grain Bowls, and quinoa was one of the ingredients along with barley and millet, uh, fresh vegetables in this item. So it's a, it's a novel way. People love the concept of bowls. It ties in with that idea of convenience without compromise. And, and is a great example of one of the ways that quinoa has been used tying into plant-based proteins and nutrition. I think one of the really exciting areas, and we've seen this over the last couple of years, is that new meat substitutes, and that's been a very popular thing. You think about Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat. Um, they've begun to look for alternatives to soy and wheat. And while there are a number of different ingredients that get used, including plant proteins, um, there, there are examples more and more where companies are using whole legumes, vegetables, oats, quinoa, and amaranth. And the one to Google, and I've included it here for you, is Frank's Pork Sausage with chickpea, quinoa, and chia seeds. And it's really leveraging this notion that quinoa is a, is a sustainable, drought-tolerant crop. So, um, again, another exciting example of how quinoa is being used. Another area where quinoa has shown some opportunity is to move into the breakfast space, uh, whether that's using quinoa as a whole seed or in a crisp or uh, ground into a flour and, and extruded. There's many different ways. This product that, we're, that I wanted to share with you is quinola beetroot quinoa-based breakfast, and that's a mouthful, but I imagine it's a delicious mouthful, and you can see that really its, it's base is beyond oats, and it's putting this emphasis on quinoa along with a number of ingredients. And we've seen that quinoa is now being featured in a number of unique categories that you might say are less than expected. We've seen it in some different um, chocolate bars. So the one highlighted here is Ritter's Fort Half Dark Chocolate with Almond and Quinoa. There's another brand, Alter Eco, that is, is using quinoa in its chocolate products. Um, in the yogurt world, Danone has introduced a cereal with yogurt and quinoa, and Wise Nature introduced a version of hummus, um, cumus. I don't know if I'm saying that right, so if you work for Wise Nature, I'm sorry about that, but that has uh, real quinoa in it. So again, lots of different ways, and I think that whole idea of, of pairing with dairy has led to the, introduce, or the, the interest in using quinoa in plant-based beverages. So in Asia, in particular, we already see quinoa being 
used for a number of different products. In China, they have uh, quinoa, koi seed, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly either, and red bean flavored beverage. Malaysia has a quinoa, soy, and vanilla drink. And Singapore has a soy milk with real oat in quinoa. So beverage is another exciting product category that you know, many years ago, we probably weren't thinking about how can we use quinoa on there. Maybe some of the innovators were. But today, it's gaining more popularity, and we see plant-based beverages like this increasing in popular, popularity in the U.S. and in Canada and across the world. So, again, another great opportunity for quinoa. And then for my last couple of slides, I just wanted to highlight how quinoa has done on restaurant menus. And this is looking at, at U.S. menus, and the restaurant industry has been particularly impacted with COVID-19, and we certainly wish and want to support restaurants. Um, and wish them better uh, as, as they work towards recovery. Um, prior to COVID though, that we, we had seen that two of the most common grain ingredients were growing extremely well on restaurant menus. So we have brown rice, but you look at quinoa right there, up 31% in terms of menu incidents from 2017 to 2020. So that's quinoa being called out on a menu as a particular ingredient. And uh, last but not least, uh, this is a slide from Data Central, which looks at restaurant menus uh, across the country. And this is their menu adoption cycle. And many of you have probably seen this, and, and for those of you who haven't, though, what it looks at is different types of ingredients as they're showing up on menus and where they are in terms of a menu adoption curve. It's really a great indicator of which in ingredients are, are maybe up and comers and which ones have achieved a high level of success. And you can see on the left are inception. That's really ingredients that are in the fine dining space. It's, it's the earliest stage of adoption. Um, the next level is adoption. That's where trendy restaurants and maybe some specialty grocers are using the ingredient. Then you achieve proliferation where chain restaurants are beginning to use it. It's appearing in mainstream grocery and then ubiquity. That's a, as it says, you find it just about everywhere. And the stuff you find in ubiquity is what you might expect, corn, wheat, oats, brown rice, rye, et cetera. Those are, people are familiar with them and, and they're everywhere. But you can see, I've highlighted right here, quinoa has achieved proliferation. It wasn't that long ago where it would have been at the inception and an adoption phase. But this is significant where quinoa, of all the ancient grains, um, has achieved a level of popularity. There's still room to grow. But um, it says in many ways that quinoa has arrived and the future is extremely bright. So that brings me to my summary, which is one, that as we learned from our ingredient tracker work, that quinoa has, is the highest rated grain in terms of health perception and has a high purchase impact for a variety of consumers and psychographic groups. It's seen as an important source of plant-based nutrition and ties extremely well into a number of current trends as I talked about with our drivers of innovation. Its global popularity has continued to increase over the last several years and is being spurred by um, novel products across a number of categories from bowls to plant-based meats to breakfast cereals and beverages and, and I'm sure there are many more. And it's achieved a significant amount of success in food service. but as with anything, it's got room to grow. And again, I think that's encouraging for all of us who uh, adore and love quinoa and want to see it succeed because of the, the positive benefits it has, not only for people uh, from a personal health perspective, but also for the lives of farmers around the world who grow it and the businesses who, who use it to sustain growth and employ people across the globe as well. So um, that's it. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've found some interesting information and I think at this point, I'll open it up to take some questions. Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Don, for that talk. Um, we're going to be moving into um, our next speakers. Um, uh, Tim Schultz and Bryce Lundberg before taking questions and we'll have lots of time. Oh. Sorry, Sonia. Muy bien. Uh, muchísimas gracias, Don, por esta presentación. Uh, nosotros vamos a continuar con los siguientes eh, presentadores, Don Truba eh, y Tim Schultz. 
Así que... Um, and uh, we will have plenty of time for questions at the end. Y vamos a tener suficiente tiempo para preguntas al final. Please ask your questions in the Q&A box down below. Por favor, um, escriban, hagan sus preguntas en la caja para preguntas y respuestas abajito de la pantalla de Zoom. So without further ado, I'd like to move on to our next talk. Bueno, sin más preámbulos, vamos a continuar con nuestra siguiente presentación. Welcome to the Farm to Market session. Uh, today's presenters are Bryce Lundberg, Vice President of Agriculture at Lundberg Family Farms and third generation member of the Lundberg family, and Tim Schultz, Executive Vice President of Operations at Lundberg Family Farms. They have led Lundberg's entrance into the U.S. grown quinoa market over the past eight years, building Lundberg's brand into the leading provider of U.S. grown organic quinoa in the market today. Bryce and Tim will share some of their practical expertise gained over the past eight years as they've applied the same vertically integrated model into the quinoa market as they've brought to the rice market. With that, I'd like to welcome and thank Bryce and Tim for joining us today and turn the floor over to them. Thank you, Rachel, I appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Today, we'd like to bring you along on the journey we've experienced the past eight years as we've learned how to grow, harvest, store, and process quinoa in the United States. It's not been a straight line path for us, but we're happy our efforts are showing results at retail grocers and natural food stores across the United States. Let's begin with a brief video overview of the journey, narrated by Bryce. At Lundberg Family Farms, we lead with a longer view of family, food, and organic farming. Since 1937, we've been growing healthy, great tasting rice while tending for soil, air, water, and wildlife as carefully as our crops. Around 2012, some 75 years after we started farming rice, consumers began to show interest in quinoa. Retailers looked to us to connect them with domestically grown quinoa. We saw the effort as consistent with our desire to reduce food miles and crop diversity has always been key to cultivating a resilient food system. So we began reaching out to farmers who had been experimenting with quinoa, like Blake Richards in Humboldt County, and Washington State University, whose scientific, technical, and moral support was indispensable as we studied this ancient grain. How to process and pack it, where, how, and under what conditions it grows best, Research trials taught us that the North Coast is the perfect place with help from the temperate climate, nutrient-rich soil, and local organic farmers. We're proud to grow quinoa in Humboldt County and pleased with the reception it is receiving from retailers across America, as it is now found on store shelves from California to New York, from Washington State to Florida. Bryce does a great job in describing our eight-year journey together in under two minutes. I'd like to talk with you now a bit about our retail journey. When we first started exploring getting into the quinoa business over eight years ago, we were told by our retail partners that they had quinoa from South America already. And if we wanted to bring something to the retail shelf, it needed to be uniquely Lundberg and consistent with our overall brand. So we decided the best approach would be to bring a U.S. grown product to retailers, which didn't exist in the mass market at that time. You can see some examples here on the page of our product on retail shelves at some different stores around the country. There was a lot for us to figure out about quinoa from how to grow it to how to get it on the store shelf. We're gonna to start today's presentation at the retail shelf. We be began by convincing a few key retailers to take on our product. At the time we launched it, quinoa prices had peaked and we were beginning to see a dramatic downward spiral in price. It was tough going in the market to explain why an American grown organic quinoa deserved shelf space alongside a plethora of other options, particularly at a time when the competition's prices were falling. 
our story with retailers was that this product had a reliable domestic source, would be predictably priced, not experiencing the peaks and valleys of imported quinoa, and tasted great. It's taken us several years, but we now see our product on the, short, on the store shelves of retailers from coast to coast. In most retail stores, quinoa sits adjacent to rice, so for our brand, this is a natural extension from our existing shelf set. A big part of our brand proposition is connecting consumers with the farm. To support this, our marketing department has brought reporters, influencers, bloggers, and retailers out to our operation on the north coast of California. The picture in the upper center of this slide is from a tour we had last summer with food writers from some prominent media outlets. There's nothing like showing the product in the field as it's grown and the beautiful surroundings of the north coast. Introducing them to the farmers we work with reinforces the authenticity of our story. It's taken a lot of patience as we've continued to build demand for our products nationwide. It definitely was not a straight line from launch to where we are today, but we're pleased our products resonating with retailers and consumers and feel the investment we've made is expanding our lineup beyond rice into quinoa and will continue to pay dividends in the years to come. A big part of our quinoa journey involves infrastructure. Certainly working with organic farmers to grow quinoa was the first and most personal step. However, assuring that we could dry, clean, store, and mill quinoa was a close second. Initially, our quinoa was stored in totes with no environmental control, essentially in ambient air. Soon we were able to move the quinoa totes into a more controlled atmosphere. Our goal is to receive quinoa at harvest in bulk into grain bins engineered for quinoa. These bins have quinoa appropriate perforated floors, fans, and are sealed for insect capabilities. Before our quinoa can be milled, it needs to be cleaned. Unlike the rice mill, our quinoa mill is not designed to process quinoa directly from the field. Fortunately, we have a seed cleaning facility that we use for our rice seed. This seed cleaning facility is simple, but it does an adequate job preparing quinoa for milling. All of our quinoa is conditioned in this facility prior to, uh, to milling. When I think of infrastructure, buildings and machines come to mind. However, one of the areas related to infrastructure where we struggle involves how quinoa reacts during drying, storing, and handling. In our rice business, we have long established industry-supported shrink formulas. Moisture shrink, dockage shrink, invisible loss are understood and accepted in many commodities. We do not have an industry standard for quinoa. I think we need it. It seems we can lose quinoa weight just transferring from one trailer to another. After we dry, clean, and store quinoa, the weight we deliver to the mill is substantially less than the quinoa we received at harvest. We are working with Dr. Pan at UC Davis to develop shrink formulas appropriate for quinoa. The formulas you see here in the, uh, in the screen, those are uh, for rice, and we're looking forward to, uh, to getting quinoa shrink formulas uh, just for quinoa. After we brought quinoa in from the field, cleaned it and stored it, we need to get it ready to be packed for our consumers. There are two primary objectives we have in this process, to remove the bitter saponin from the outer layer of the seed and to polish it to be appealing to consumers as a finished product. You can see the transformation of quinoa from raw, the raw form on the left to the finished form on the right. We begin by bringing the cleaned quinoa uh, in from our drying and storage facilities in four by four bins as pictured here on the left. Our very first quinoa was hand milled on a lab scale polisher. This was extremely slow and inconsistent. Our next evolution was to purchase Volcano equipment to remove the saponin and polish the seed. 
This was significantly more efficient than the lab scale equipment, but still had substantial limitations in terms of the volume that could be processed. We then added a polisher, which is shown in the middle picture on this slide. It improved our throughput tremendously. We also work with an outside company in cases where we want to provide further processing of washing the quinoa before we pack it. Vice's nephew, Luke Lundberg, completed his Master of Science at Cal Poly last year and decided to investigate alternative methods of saponin removal in quinoa using abrasion processing for his master's thesis. He explored a number of methods for abrasion processing, comparing the results with both unprocessed quinoa and washed quinoa. What his research found was that the abrasion method of processing could match or exceed the water method of processing in terms of the amount of saponin remaining on the seed after processing. We're continuing to explore his research and prove it out with consumer testing, as elimination of washing could lead to significant environmental benefits by reducing the amount of water needed in processing. It's always helpful to have a food scientist in the family. As Tim mentioned, our quinoa milling process is a dry milling process. With every quinoa mill run, we develop dry saponin. Our rice byproducts are generally well suited as ingredients for human or animal food. Quinoa saponin is not. We believe, though, that quinoa saponin has valuable untapped potential. Studies indicate that quinoa saponin has natural disease suppression qualities. Internal studies indicate that saponin can reduce levels of seed germination for a short period of time. Also, our study indicates that saponin has positive fertility components. Here you can see uh, just a, a sample of a, a nutrient analysis we had done on some white uh, quinoa saponin. I would like to make a few comments regarding insects and quinoa. Quinoa is a new crop to our area. We were and are unsure how quinoa and insects will cohabitate. As you may know, our family headquarters and our rice farms are in the Sacramento Valley. We started growing quinoa on our rice fields as a rotational crop. We could see opportunity and promise. However, insects and weather soon became barriers to success. I had never identified ligus as a pest in our rice, our vetch, oats, or fava beans. Very quickly, ligus identified and found our quinoa fields in the Sacramento Valley. Ligus showed up in droves. They fed on developing seeds. They are able to hide effectively in the quinoa inflorescence and cause significant damage to the crop. Same situation with stem borers. Stem borers are not a problem with our normal rotations, but they are present, utilizing resident plants as hosts. As we planted quinoa as a rotation crop, the stem borers moved into the quinoa. And um, we know aphids live in our region. We discovered that aphids like quinoa. Here you can see a field on April 30th, how robust and uh, what a healthy crop of quinoa. This is in the Sacramento Valley. 14 days later, by May 14th, um, the aphids moved in and nearly destroyed the quinoa crop. Fortunately, these three pests have not made road inroads into quinoa production on the north coast. The organic farmers growing quinoa are experienced and knowledgeable farmers. However, there is little information on controlling these pests, if or when they may find coastal quinoa. You know, that is a risk we're taking as we grow quinoa, is that we don't have good control measures for ligus, stem borers, or aphids, and something that I think would be great to, to understand more. The other issues that, uh, that we need to address are, are weather, or weather-related, both heat and rain. Weather is a big consideration choosing where to plant quinoa. As you can see in this uh, graph, the Sacramento Valley, where we have our home, farm, and our office, is too hot in the summer to grow quinoa. 
Our experience is that 90 degrees can sterilize quinoa. And so we would have to plant quinoa in order to avoid that heat in our rainy period. And as you can see in the box, we would be having to plant it in a time when we would have significant rain. It, it, is, uh, it is impossible. So we have moved to the, uh, to the coast. To, uh, to the north coast. And here you can see in Humboldt County and western Washington, we have a much more suitable weather for quinoa to avoid heat sterility. Then also you can see when we would be planting that the weather pattern indicates that grow, grow, the growing season is suitable and rain during harvest can be avoided. Finally, our experience involves both irrigated and unirrigated quinoa. Growers can be very successful growing quinoa in a dryland setting, as you can see the Wilson standing in a dryland quinoa field in the upper left. However, in general, fields that are irrigated have a higher yield uh, and, than the dryland, as you can see in, in the other three uh, pictures uh, that are all of irrigated quinoa. And so, uh, and we also find that quinoa is very good at, uh, at engaging the nutrition in the soil, but it does respond to, uh, to fertility. So um, irrigated and unirrigated, though, both will uh, be successful. Once you realize how much effort it takes to build the entire quinoa supply chain from seed to finished product, you want to optimize the uses of this incredible seed. One of the things we've done to support demand for packaged quinoa is to feature recipes on our social media to give consumers lots of creative ideas on how they can make tasty dishes. You're also likely familiar with a number of ways that quinoa is finding its way into other value-added products like side dishes, snack clusters, chips, cookies, even chocolate bars. We continue to look for uses of quinoa in a variety of products and applaud the work of other companies who've developed creative applications for quinoa. And I'll provide you some insight into how we've taken the concept of American-grown quinoa from field to retail shelves. I'd like to finish up by providing some insight into the market outlook. This slide shows you the household penetration of quinoa over the past five years. It peaked in 2017 around 6% and has slid since then back down to its uh, kind of stasis, which has been around 5%. Obviously, there's a lot of room for upside by increasing the number of households that consume quinoa. This slide shows the sales of quinoa over the past three years. You can see there was steady downward trajectory in sales from May of 2017 through February of 2020. Over the last several months, sales have grown back to levels last seen in 2018. Of course, there was a significant driver of grocery products that overlays exactly with this increase in quinoa sales, the COVID-19 pandemic. It remains to be seen whether this 20% increase in demand will continue, but from all signs we're seeing, it is likely to continue in the near term as many consumers who have shifted their eating patterns during the pandemic continue their new habits. From our perspective, quinoa is a valuable seed for Americans' diets. It's healthy, environmentally friendly, and provides a sustainable return to farmers. Thank you for joining us for this quick review of quinoa from farm to market. Yeah, thank you very much. And Tim, I want to thank you for your strong leadership here at Lundberg Family Farms in, and your dedication to this crop and to Washington State University, to Kevin Murphy for your dedication, for your partnership, and for your encouragement. And um, I just also want to just thank the, uh, the rest of the team here at Lundberg Family Farms because Tim and I uh, really enjoy uh, working with Tim, but we have just a great team, both of farmers and of team members here at Lundberg Family Farms. Without them, uh, uh, this would not be a successful project. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Bryce and Tim.
Hi, Sonia. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias to Bryce y Tim. Uh, and, to, um, and to Don again. Y para Don también otra vez. Um, we are very fortunate to have uh, about 20 minutes for questions. Um, nos sentimos muy afortunados de tener más o menos 20 minutos para contestar preguntas. And we have quite a few to start with. Y tenemos algunas para comenzar. Uh, I imagine more specific questions for Tim and Bryce's talk will come in shortly. Me imagino que más adelante vamos a tener más preguntas para Don y Tim. But I'd like to start with some general questions um, for all of our speakers regarding marketing quinoa. Pero me gustaría empezar con preguntas generales para todos nuestros um, presentadores en relación con el mercadeo de la quinoa. Um, our first question comes from Juan Luis Salinas Davila. Nuestra pre primera pregunta viene de Juan Luis Savila Davila. Juan asks, how important is the organic certification for the consumers that you're targeting? Y él pregunta, ¿qué tan importante es la certificación orgánica para los consumidores a los que ustedes le están apuntando? Uh, I'd like to direct that question to Don first and then to Tim and Bryce. Me gustaría primero dirigir esa pregunta a Don y luego a Tim y a Bryce. So I can get started. Can you, first of all, can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Don't need to translate Yo puedo that. empezar. Entonces, <laughs> primero que todo, ¿me pueden escuchar? No es importante, no es importante. Okay, um, so it, the organic certification is very important for some segments of consumers and all oh, it's up there. Bueno, pues la certificación orgánica es muy importante para algunos segmentos de consumidores. Um, in particular, so in my talk, I, I looked at, you know, you think about natural consumers, clean label, sustainability. En mi presentación, eh, particularmente, yo hablé sobre los consumidores naturales, sobre los que buscan mm -hmm. una etiqueta, eh, ¿cómo diría? Como correcta. What was the other part? Uh, uh, well, so for clean label, natural okay. consumers, I think I said, as well as sustainability. Así como también la sostenibilidad. Uh, there is a high affinity for organic, which in general has a, a positive perception and connotation. Hay una alta afinidad por las cosas orgánicas. Y pues en general es algo que estamos viendo muy seguido. It also depends on the ingredient. Pero también depende del ingrediente. Tim, you might have some thoughts as well. Tim, de pronto tú tienes algo otras cosas para agregar aquí? Sure, thank, thank you, Don. For our consumers, organic is a, is a key attribute. All of the new products that we've launched over the last 10 years have been certified organic. And so not only for our consumers, but also for our company's philosophy, uh, we are focused on organic production. Muchas gracias, Don. Bueno, pues para nuestros consumidores, los productos orgánicos son muy importantes. No solo para los consumidores, también para nuestra compañía. Nuestra filosofía es llevar productos orgánicos a sus mesas. Thank you so much for answering those questions. Um, we, our next question comes from uh, Catherine Sykes. Muchas gracias por responder a esta pregunta. Nuestra siguiente pregunta viene de Catherine Sykes. Uh, both, in both of your talks, uh, you covered um, a lot of market analytics for directly to uh, small consumers. And las, sus dos charlas, ustedes hablaron 
del análisis del mercado para los dos, eh, para la venta y para el consumo? Um, I'd love for uh, you to comment on uh, larger contracts, particularly with schools or other government agencies. Me gustaría que ustedes hablaran un poco de contratos un poco más grandes, específicamente con escuelas o agencias o instituciones del gobierno. Is there a demand um, from these uh, from these consumers as well? Hay alguna demanda de parte de estos consumidores también? Tim, would you like to begin? Sure. Tim, puedes empezar, por favor. We focus on retail and direct to consumer. So our, our business model is a branded model. Uh, we have not done very much as an ingredient for others for selling it in bulk to governments or schools. Muy bien. Nosotros nos enfocamos en la venta del producto, um, así como está, en realidad no nos hemos enfocado todavía en venderlo como un ingrediente de otro producto para las escuelas y para los gobiernos. And I would add that we, so I, let me start over. I would add that we see um, there is general interest and awareness in, in some aspects of government, for example, Uh, in the military, there's some interest, uh, but we've also done a lot of work with schools. Bueno, y a mí aquí me gustaría agregar que nosotros vemos un, algún interés en algunas agencias del gobierno, especialmente en lo que tiene que ver con los militares y ver esto como una comida, eh, como un suplemento. In schools, for example, K through 12 public schools, there is interest among some districts to have different grains. The challenge is the price of the grain. Many schools, or, or ingredient I would say, many schools uh, are supported through, um, through, the, through government, at least in the United States, and so they are reimbursed at certain levels. Um, that It can be, uh, that, well, that can be heavily influenced by the cost of the, the items that they're purchasing. Muy bien. En el caso de las escuelas, nosotros vemos que algunos distritos escolares en realidad tienen interés por uh, incluir la quinoa en sus menús, uh, pero en realidad lo que los detiene es el precio del producto, uh, porque um, ellos ma manejan un programa en el que el gobierno eh, les eh, deposita el costo de la comida. Entonces el precio es algo que ellos tienen que tener muy en cuenta y eso es lo que los mantiene un poco inhibidos de poder incluirlo en sus menús. And I wonder if this would be a good opportunity or a good outlet for conventional US quinoa markets. Y me, <laughs> y me pregunto que si esto podría ser una buena oportunidad o um, una forma de explorar un poco eh, los mercados convencionales de la quinoa y Don contesta que posiblemente. Thank you both so much for those answers. Um, our next question is for Don. Um, Uh, Gerardo Boroquez uh, asks, um, 41% of the population is willing to pay for quality. Bueno, la siguiente pregunta es para Don um, de Gerardo Borges y dice, 41% de la población está dispuesta a pagar por calidad. Uh, how does this affect your marketing strategy uh, for, uh, uh, for quinoa? ¿Cómo afecta esto su estrategia de mercadeo para la quinoa? The first thing I would say is that at Ardent Mills and the annex by Ardent Mills and, and with the acquisition of Andean Naturals, 
we're primarily focused on selling to other businesses. Uh, we don't um, have our own uh, retail consumer brand like Lundberg does. Bueno, lo primero que tengo que decir es que Arden Mills, la compañía, the annex by Arden Mills, and um, what was the other company done? Sorry, I forgot. Indian Naturals, the company uh, founded by Sergio. Indian Naturals, um, and please say it again, the, the last part. Oh, he's a speaker, Sergio Nunez de Arco. Uh -huh. No, but the last part of your answer. Oh. That they are focused <laughs> on what? Um, so we, we primarily sell to other businesses directly um, from a marketing perspective, and we don't have our own retail consumer brand. Ah, muy bien. Bueno, ellos principalmente le venden a otras tiendas para que ellos distribuyan eh, o para que ellos vendan sus propios productos, pero no tienen en realidad una marca que ellos vendan directamente. But what I would say is that Um, you know, we take that information and we partner with companies that we work with so that they're aware of the value of the ingredients that they're sourcing from us and that they think about that from a pricing perspective for their, their end consumer. Bueno, pero nosotros miramos a esos datos estadísticos y nos unimos con compañías que crean otros productos y les mostramos eh, cuáles son las tendencias del mercado para que ellos decidan si es algo que pueden agregar a su línea de productos y si va a ser rentable en términos de precio. And I would just say that in that statistic, so 41% of people say they're extremely or very likely to pay 10% more for um, a healthier food. So if I was to have a brand and I'd love to hear what Tim would say about this, If you're depending on who you're targeting as your consumer, you would want to factor that in into your overall pricing strategy. Y lo que tengo que decir de ahí es que en las estadísticas que estábamos mostrando, 41% de las personas están dispuestos a pagar 10% más en el valor de un producto si este producto es saludable. Bryce, would you like to jump in here? Well, uh, well sure, Tim. Um, I, um, I would say our consumer is, um, is looking for consistent uh, quality and consistent price. And um, I, I, I'm not sure, you know, how, how much more they're willing to pay, um, but um, I think they are pleased to have consistency in quality and price, and that's what we're uh, trying to deliver. Uh, Tim, would you expand on that? Bueno, para continuar con lo que dice Don, eh, en realidad el consumidor quiere consistencia en términos de calidad y en términos de precio. Entonces, para nosotros es muy importante mantener esa confianza del consumidor en términos de calidad y de precio. Tim, ¿le gustaría expandir un poco sobre esto? Yes, our, our target consumer is the one that is looking for healthier options, is looking for sustainability, uh, is looking for clean label, and uh, they do tend to be willing to pay more for that, although that's not foremost in our mind as we're pricing it. We're looking for sustainable practices all the way back to the farm and making sure that the growers that we're work, working with uh, get a good price for their product and that the consumers that we work with could get a good value for their food. Bueno, pues sí, nuestros consumidores buscan eh, precio, buscan una etiqueta limpia, buscan sostenibilidad. Um, y nosotros buscamos que dentro de todo este proceso, el consumidor final tenga todas las cosas que busca, um, pero también tenemos que estar siempre pendientes de, del, del precio, que eso no incremente demasiado el, el costo. Tim, that's a great lead into my next question. Tim, esa es una buena forma de ir para mi siguiente pregunta. 
I imagine Bryce will want to comment on this. Uh, me imagino que Bryce va a querer comentar sobre esto. For your consumers, how important is it for them to have some relationship with the original farmer for your quinoa? Para el consumidor, ¿qué tan importante es tener una, algún tipo de relación con el productor de la quinoa? Great question. Um, you know, I think that was the kind of the beginning of our, our project or, or, or uh, quinoa story is that the consumers wanted to uh, have us grow organic quinoa here in, in the U.S., uh, here in California. And, and it is that connection with them uh, that we want to offer. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's, that's right on target for, uh, for what we're doing. Bueno, pues esto va muy de la mano con lo que nosotros hacemos. En el principio de, dijimos que nosotros en realidad queremos que el consumidor se sienta conectado con el productor y, y eso es la forma orgánica en la que producimos, en la que nuestros productores eh, cultivan la quinoa. Es una forma en la que el consumidor se siente conectado. Tim, do you have anything to add to that? ¿Le gustaría agregar algo, Tim? No. Excellent. Um, our next question is from Jack Hoagland. Nuestra siguiente pregunta es de Jack Hoagland. Um, and this could be for any speaker that wants to comment. Y esta puede ser para cualquiera de nuestros presentadores que quiera comentar o responder. Uh, Jack asks, uh, for, uh, for importers into the U.S., what qualities in quinoa uh, uh, are most important? Bueno, Jack pregunta por los importadores dentro de Estados Unidos. ¿Cuáles son las cualidades de la quinoa que son más importantes? Jack suggests maybe origin um, or potentially um, organic status or even uh, physical aspects of the quinoa. Jack uh, propone, por ejemplo, el origen o um, cómo se ve el producto, um, la calidad. Any thoughts? I know you all mostly work with, uh, with uh, farmers uh, in the U.S. already. Um, Algunas ideas que ustedes tengan sobre eso. Yo sé que trabajan con agricultores dentro de los Estados Unidos ya. I can start with that. Uh, so, and we, we work with importers. And number one would be quality. Bueno, puedo empezar con eso. Y nosotros trabajamos con los importadores. Y la característica número uno es la calidad. And that includes things like foreign materials, level of saponin. Uh, depending on their customer, they might be interested in, in the claims associated with that, like organic or fair trade. Bueno, y eso incluye eh, los materiales o lo que se utiliza para el cultivar, um, el saponeo o saponificación, el nivel de, ese, de la saponificación. And then after that, um, well, I also mentioned things like fair trade and organic, depending on their customer. Y también mencioné cosas como el intercambio, el mercadeo, dependiendo de los consumidores. Um, the next important thing would be logistics, service with logistics, um, managing it, keeping them apprised, making sure it's reliable. El siguiente, la siguiente cosa es el, la logística y el manejo, eh, manteniendo todo eh, organizado, eh, bien hecho. And uh, the final part would just be um, being consistent with contracts, um, you know, respecting contracted prices and essentially honoring contracts. Uh, 
Y la última parte tiene que ver con los contratos, eh, respetando los, contra los contratos, los precios, um, manejando todo lo que tiene que ver con el área de, de contratos con diferentes um, proveedores y compañías. Thank you so much, Don. Tim or Bryce, would you like to add anything to uh, Don's comments? Muchas gracias, Don. Uh, Tim or Bryce, ¿le gustaría agregar algo a los comentarios de Don? We're not currently importing any quinoa. When we first uh, started including quinoa in some of our products, we did import. And for us, the most important was the certifications. Uh, organic and fair trade, and then the second was reliability. So we were promised a price of a certain number of dollars per pound that what was delivered was that volume at that uh, at that price. And uh, that's that's something that we had to get used to in terms of dealing with other, other supplies is, is we never had that question uh, here with our own suppliers. Uh, but that was something that came on, up many years ago when we were initially dealing with imported quinoa. Bueno, en este momento nosotros no estamos importando quinoa de ningún lugar, pero al principio cuando hicimos, cuando importamos un poco de quinoa, mirábamos a la, los certificados y a los tratados de libre comercio, a los certificados de que fuera un producto orgánico y todas las cosas que, que dijo Don. En este momento, en realidad, no lo estamos haciendo, pero eh, eh, así que no, no lo necesitamos mucho, pero es algo que, que sí vimos en el inicio y con lo que trabajamos ya. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, we had quite a few questions um, about uh, the saponin removal process um, used at Lundberg Family Farms. Tenemos algunas preguntas sobre la saponina, el, cómo es el proceso de la saponina en sus granjas. I know there's only so much detail you can share about the saponin removal process, but would you be willing to go into a little bit more detail about that? Yo entiendo que ustedes no pueden compartir detalles específicos sobre el proceso, pero nos pueden dar más o menos una idea de cómo funciona, de cómo lo hacen. And um, to comment a little bit more on uh, alternative uses for saponins um, and for disposal. Y pues comentar un poco más sobre el usos alternativos del saponeo y el proceso. Bryce, would you like to start? Bryce, ¿te gustaría empezar? Well, sure. Um, uh, our saponin removal process is a dry uh, saponin removal process and, and it's really uh, I think very simple it's uh, scarifying using abrasion to remove the um, this saponin um, and um, and then we have um, our team that does that is, is very uh, well, they're very good at uh, at knowing how how long uh, to um, to set the machine for the saponin uh, to be removed and uh, and are very good at then analyzing the um, uh, the amount of saponin that's been removed or, or that remains. Uh, Tim, would you like to, to follow up? We'll, we'll pause here for the translation for a moment. Well, um, bueno, en nuestra, um, nuestra forma de, de saponificación es eh, una forma de saponificación seca utilizando el proceso de abrasión y pues nuestra, nuestros trabajadores lo hacen muy bien. Así que um, ese es más o menos el, el proceso que, que utilizamos para, para el saponeo eh, y pues um, de ahí entonces miramos qué, qué, qué otras partes se pueden utilizar. I would say that it's been a learning process for us. And one of the keys for effective saponin uh, removal in a dry process is not to get the saponin, not to get the seed too hot. So there are a series of steps that we have learned over time to not have too much dwell time in the uh, 
scarification process. Muy bien, pues este ha sido un proceso en el que hemos aprendido mucho y una de las cosas que hemos aprendido es que no se puede calentar demasiado la semilla en el proceso. Entonces, um, algo que, que hemos eh, aprendido de esto es, es esa parte, que en el, cualquier proceso que hagamos, la semilla no se debe calentar demasiado. And the second part of the question is uses for the saponin. Uh, for a long time, we were just collecting it, trying to find uses or find places to dispose of it. And Bryce's team has come up with some really great um, solutions for that. Bryce, do you want to tell them about some of those? Bueno, y en el caso de, de los usos de esa saponificación, en realidad no le habíamos encontrado ningún uso. Siempre estábamos buscando por, eh, maneras de deshacernos de esa saponificación y cómo hacerlo de la mejor manera. Pero últimamente hemos tenido eh, muy buenas ideas y entonces quiero que Bryce les comente un poco sobre qué, qué, cómo estamos planeando eh, eh, utilizarlos. Thank you. The, um, there, are, there are quite a few uses for it. The primary use we use it for right now is for um, uh, soil amending. Um, and, um, and so it, it's taken out to our, our fields and, and spread as a, uh, a soil amendment. And, and you could see that it has some uh, good fertility uh, components. Bueno, pues... Um... Sí, el uso principal para lo que lo estamos usando en este momento es para abonar los cultivos. Lo estamos usando para utilizarlo como una forma de proveer abono a los cultivos. We are testing the saponin uh, for its disease suppression uh, qualities. And uh, it is in one of our tests um, with natural uh, disease um, or fungicides uh, in, our, um, in our rice uh, with several other um, organic materials. And, and it shows good promise. Bueno, también lo estamos considerando como un fungicida. Eh, estamos trabajando en eso. Parece que promete bastante eh, para utilizarlo de esa forma. In the uh, um, Marone Bio uh, in, at Davis is also experimenting with our um, saponin extract uh, in their materials. También uh, hay una compañía que está experimentando con el extracto del saponeo para sus materiales. We have tested the, uh, the saponin and, um, and, and, and wanted to know what, what its impact might be on uh, seeds. Um, and it, in high, um, in high um, uh, Uh, quantities, it does have germination suppression uh, uh, impact on, on seeds. Uh, and, and that was a study we did internally uh, uh, in our uh, research department. Bueno, um, algo que estudiamos en nuestro en nuestra área de investigación fue el efecto que esa, ese saponeo tiene en la germinación de las semillas. Y parece que inhibe un poco la germinación de las semillas. Entonces es algo que, que hemos estado viendo. Es un experimento que llevamos a cabo eh, y que estamos mirando. So as we bring it out to uh, our field to use as a soil amendment, uh, we want to give it plenty of time to, uh, to break down uh, before uh, seeding it. De modo que a medida que lo estamos llevando como un suplemento para la tierra, como un abono para el suelo, tenemos que ser conscientes de que le tenemos que dar tiempo para que se descomponga y no vaya a tener un efecto negativo en la germinación de las semillas cuando nuestros agricultores plantan. Thank you so much, Bryce. Muchísimas gracias, Bryce. Um, I have one final question um, for all of our speakers today. Tengo la última pregunta para todos nuestros presentadores hoy. And this is a selfish question for members of the Sustainable Seed Systems Lab. 
Y esta es una pregunta un poco envidiosa, si lo podríamos llamar en inglés, eh, del laboratorio de eh, sostenibilidad de la universidad. Uh, we talked a lot about quinoa today. What other alternative seed crops are you most interested in experimenting with for your consumers and your customers? Eh, hemos hablado bastante sobre la quinoa hoy. ¿Qué otros productos eh, se han planteado ustedes eh, investigar o, o llevar al mercado para los consumidores? Don, we'll start with you. Vamos a empezar contigo, Don. Uh -huh. So the question is what other other seeds and crops, uh, correct? Especially more alternative seed crops and um, yeah, specialty, specialty crops. La pregunta tiene que ver con qué otras semillas o cultivos um, estamos planeando llevar al mercado. Eh, y esto lo llaman como semillas o cultivos especiales. Don, I know you work with much more than just quinoa. Porque yo sé que usted trabaja con otros productos además de la quinoa. First, I would say there's still a, a tremendous amount of work to be done with quinoa. So um, whether it's different varieties, different qualities, that's, uh, we're not like beyond quinoa by any means. Um, that's a very important part for us. We also are looking at other types of ingredients like legumes, um, chickpeas, which You know, people are quite familiar with, but um, we have a fair amount of, of work that we think that can be done there. Um, we continue to look at uh, a lot of heirloom varieties or heritage varieties of a number of grains. Um, so even, even wheat, which Ardent Mills is known for, there's lots of varieties from the past that have been used like spelt or uh, white Sonora wheat. Um, and then in terms of, of what's next, uh, You know, we continue to hear about things like Fonio. I think we're trying to understand, um, you know, what what that ingredient offers. How is it grown? What does its supply chain look like? There's a lot of unanswered questions. Bueno, pues para empezar, um, dentro del aspecto de la quinoa, todavía no lo hemos explorado todo. Hay mucho todavía por decir. Hay mucho todavía por aprender. En relación con, con la quinoa, hay muchas variedades, hay muchas cosas que todavía podemos explorar. Pero si vamos a hablar de otros productos, además de la quinoa, bueno, pues estamos mirando algunas variedades de um, granos, como arvejas, lentejas, eh, garbanzos, eh, e incluso variedades de trigo, variedades que no han sido tan han exploradas, no son tan conocidas todavía. Entonces estamos mirando también en esos aspectos eh, para, para otros productos. Nada súper nuevo, nuevo, pero sí hay, hay variedades um, que, que, que parecen interesantes y que prometen bastante. Thank you so much, Don. And thank you, Sonia. That was, that was awesome. Yeah, um, <laughs> big, big props, I, I try uh, big my props best. to our translator. <laughs> um, uh, Tim, do you have any comments on uh, uh, other, other crops you're interested in? Yes, we're always looking for uh, additional opportunities. But quite frankly, I agree with Don that quinoa still has a long ways to go. Uh, Rice was introduced into California over 100 years ago. And uh, in many ways, we feel like we are with quinoa, where the early pioneers in rice in California were 100 years ago. So we, we think we have a lot still to learn and a lot to do with quinoa. But I know that uh, Bryce is very interested in a particular cover crop. And we've done a lot of work with uh, Washington State and with others on that cover crop. Uh, Bryce. Muy bien, well, pues oh. estoy de acuerdo con Dan. Todavía tenemos mucha tela de donde cortar con relación a la, a la quinoa. Eh, tenemos mucho que aprender con relación a la quinoa. Y eh, eh, para nosotros en el estado de California, la semilla de la quinoa uh, nos fue dada hace más de 100 años y hemos ah. estado trabajando con con ella, con este cultivo, um, 
hay, hay mucho todavía por, por aprender aquí, por explorar, pero yo sé que Bryce ha estado trabajando con un nuevo producto con la Universidad Estatal de Washington. Entonces, um, ¿qué nos puede contar sobre esto? John, you and, and, uh, and Tim are uh, exactly right. There is so much more opportunity in quinoa, and, uh, and we want to focus uh, on that. Um, at Lundberg, we have a tricolor, red and white, and we also have black, a beautiful black quinoa. We haven't even introduced it yet. Bueno, pues estoy completamente de acuerdo con ustedes. Tenemos todavía mucho por aprender e investigar sobre la quinoa, pero nosotros aquí tenemos eh, una variedad tricolor, incluso eh, roja, blanca y negra, que nunca la hemos en realidad eh, explotado. Apenas estamos empezando con esta variedad negra. Uh, but Tim, I don't want to um, uh, avoid your question, uh, but I did want to say, you know, we grow 17 varieties of rice, and, and so I think there is an 18th or 19th or 20th variety of rice, uh, too. Bueno, no, no me quiero eh, divertir de, de su pregunta, o no quiero um, no responderla, pero nosotros tenemos 17 variedades de arroz. Y yo creo que podemos tener una 18, 19 y 20. Um, así que estamos ahí en eso. But the best, as we say to last, is the fava bean. And isn't that what the world needs more fava beans? It is a gift of nature. It, it grows in a rice field in the wintertime. It takes nutrition from the air and puts it into the soil and into the stem. The leaves are edible. The young beans are fresh edible. And the dry bean makes an amazing soup and hummus. Bueno, pero algo de lo que estamos muy contentos y emocionados es de el frijol de haba. El frijol de haba es una variedad que crece prácticamente silvestremente en medio del arroz, en cualquier lugar. Es muy fácil de cosechar, es muy nutricional. Entonces, eh, sí, estamos ahora explorando esto porque es algo magnífico. El, la, la semilla de, del, del haba o el, el, el haba como la conocemos en América Latina. Thank you so much for sharing your secret, Bryce. Oh, okay. uh, we're well, all the better for it. <laughs> there, are, there are 200 varieties held by Dr. Who in Washington State. And there's got to be some of those fava beans that are appropriate for every part of the United States and the world. Bueno, pero eso no es todo. Uh, tenemos más de 200 variedades de habas. Y um, en Doctor Who, ¿está right? El Doctor Who en yeah. la, la Universidad Estatal de Washington um, en, tiene esa, em, em, esa información sobre todas estas variedades de habas. Y esto es súper es emocionante. Y Richard le estaba agradeciendo a Bryce por contarnos su secreto sobre cuál es este, este nuevo producto y es eh, las habas. With that, I'd like to extend a final thank you to all of our speakers today, uh, to Tim, to Don, and to Bryce for sharing so much with us. Muy bien. Um, de esta forma, Quiero agradecerles a todos nuestros presentadores hoy por estar con nosotros, por compartir esta información tan valiosa, por contestar a nuestras preguntas. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Uh, with that, we're going to take a very short break and our next talk is coming up in this room very shortly and use quality and processing. Muy bien, uh, pues vamos ahorita a tomar un descanso y como ustedes pueden ver, eh, nuestra conversación en, eh, o nuestra siguiente presentación en esta sala es sobre el procesamiento y calidad del producto final. Así que nos vamos a ver o nos vemos en unos momentos.
Thank you very much and see you soon. Muchas gracias. Nos vemos pronto. Adiós. How long do we have before the next one? About five minutes. Yeah, we'll um, we'll we'll get everything started in about a minute. Oh, okay. I was thinking I was going to take a party break, but yes, go ahead, please okay. do. Um, okay. Let's... So sorry, Sonia. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to keep up. I I didn't know. That's exciting. I didn't know. Um, um you start working with Favas. We is um. About 15 or so years ago, and they were trying to implement that growing of, of favas in Colombia when I was there. And we had different oh, awesome. types and they were talking about how nutritious they were. And we have a huge tree in my mom's backyard from a variety called Chacha Fruto. Oh, that is really cool. Yeah. We should get you connected with Bryce. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know, I know. We should talk about it. I, you know, I, I was, uh, I was looking at it, it is in production. The tree is in production, at, and there, uh, my mom uses it more for feeding cattle. Okay, I'm gonna take a um, potty break. Okay, awesome, great. Yeah, we're just waiting for our next speaker to show up. I'm also gonna get a verbal confirmation from Rachel that you all are seeing my screen. I am seeing your screen. Um, so you have Garish and Sergio. Let's see, I didn't see Garish, but Sergio's here. One moment. All right, yeah, we will wait just a few more minutes. Hey guys, this is Sergio. Hey, Sergio. Hey, uh, I just wanted to test to see if you hear me. Yeah, that's that's great audio. Thank you. Okay, because I'm I'm not at my office or at home. We we were evacuated last night because there's a fire getting close to our town in oh, Northern no. California. So we had to pick up our stuff and leave like <laughs> emergency. Wow, that is terrifying. I'm glad you yeah, were there. Yeah, uh, I was able to find a place to to get some internet connection at a friend's house. So I'm I'm, I'm good though. Wow. Thank you for still joining us. <laughs> sure, no problem. No, I can't, I can't, I just can't miss this. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> All right, so that's, that's working. Should I test my video or no? Yeah, please do. We've got the time while we wait for Garish to join. Uh, awesome. That, that looks great. Yep, that looks good. And then are you able to open up the Q&A and see the Q&A? Unfortunately, I'm not. Oh, yes, I can. It says no open questions. No open questions, OK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can do it. Um, hey. Since everybody has a killer background, maybe I should get myself a different background here. 
There we go. There's my Q&A. Right. Okay, I'm back. Awesome. Great, Sonia. That worked out well. We're still waiting for one of our presenters. Okay. But I think what we'll do is um, I'm going to go ahead and open up the session. And if Grish is able to join, that's great. And we will play his talk first. And if he's still not here, we will move on straight into uh, Sergio's talk. Does that Sounds sound good. good? Awesome. OK, so Sonia, I'm going to jump into an introduction. Go ahead. Sorry. All right, so in this session, we have two longtime experts in their field. En esta sesión, tenemos dos um, personas muy experimentadas en esta área. We have Dr. Grish Ganjal and Sergio Nunez de Arco. Nosotros tenemos al Dr. Grish Ganjal y a Sergio Nunez de Arco. Dr. Grish Ganjal is interim director and associate professor. El Dr. Grish Ganjal es el director, profesor asociado, direct, um, director. And the extension food processing specialist at Washington State University School of Food Science. En la Escuela de Ciencias Alimenticias de la Universidad Estatal del Estado de Washington. Dr. Ganjal will talk about the nuances of processing and value-added options for quinoa. El Dr. Ganjal va a hablar del proceso y del valor agregado de los productos de la quinoa. Sejia Núñez de Arco is the king of quinoa as named by Time Magazine. Sergio Núñez de Arco es el rey de la quinoa, nombrado así por el... In New York Times and Magazine. Sergio co-founded the largest quinoa processing plant in the United States called Andean Natural. Eh, Sergio co-fundó la compañía más grande del procesamiento de quinoa en Estados Unidos llamada Andean Naturals. And is working to keep a seat, keep a seat at the table for indigenous farmers in a changing marketplace. Y trabaja para que los eh, campesinos de la quinoa tengan una voz en todo lo que tiene que ver con la producción y el mercadeo de la quinoa. We'll take a virtual tour of the processing plant and talk about cleaning, desaponifying, and polishing. Vamos a ver, uh, vamos a tener un tour virtual um, por el procesamiento de la quinoa, el saponeo, el proceso, el limpiado. In food processing, after graduating from UN. Okay, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Grish Ganjal. He is a faculty member in the School of Food Science at the Washington State University in Pullman, Washington. Grish received his PhD from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in food processing. After graduating from UNL, he worked as a principal scientist at MGP Ingredients Incorporated in the areas of protein and starch modifications and extrusion processing. Later, he worked at PepsiCo in their advanced research team on extrusion and frying processes before joining, before joining WSU. Garish has over nine years of industry experience in food ingredients, process technologies, and food product development, and he currently offers extension and research services for food companies of all sizes and types through the WSU Food Processing Extension and Research Programs. Garish is based in Pullman, WA. And with that, I will hand it over to Garish. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Eva. Um, and thank you for the committee as well for uh, having me in this meeting for the presentation. I do appreciate it. And thanks for everyone for listening uh, remotely. I wish that you know we were in person, but 
uh, we're we're doing this online, so hopefully this comes through uh, with the right information. But I hope that someday we'll uh, meet in person again. Okay. So I'm going to jump into my presentation. the The title, as you see it, it's on end use quality and processing for quinoa. So my goal today is to jump through uh, these four areas of uh, of the of the presentation. The number one, I'm going to focus a little bit on what is uh, the importance of food ingredient quality, um, why it's so important when it comes to the end uses, and then we'll jump a little bit into functional differences in the varieties and how that impacts the finished products. And also I have a, a little bit of uh, data that I would like to show on the impacts of the varieties and the pre-processing steps that we do before you actually use the product in the end products. And I'm going to give some examples there. And, and then I'll close out with some concluding remarks. Um, but just before I start into the presentation, I just want to tell you uh, the data I'm going to show in here was, was generated, a lot of it was generated uh, in our lab, but there is some that was from different references. Uh, so I, I thank all the students who worked on um, on these projects to, to come up with this data, okay? Um, all right, so this, a lot of you have seen it. Um, it. It's always good to kind of look at what we are trying to process. And this is a seed of uh, quinoa. And what you see here is uh, a cross section of it. You have the perisperm, the seed cut, the germ, the radical. Um, but in general, from a general sense, when you look at quinoa or any other grains, um, or seeds, usually the fiber is located on the outside and then in the in the center, um, either the perisperm or, or in some grains we call it endosperm, that's where most of the carbohydrates and proteins are located. Um, so it's, it's something important to understand because many times when we process the seeds into a flower, uh, uh, a lot of the grains that we see outside in the market now, they would have removed the outside shell or outside layer which contains the fiber. Okay. But when it comes to whole grain flowers, then that is included in it. Okay. All right. So in terms of products, so quinoa, as all of you know, has been um, a hot commodity for the uh, last few years, and many people have tried to use them into different products. And here are some examples that we see on the screen, which we just pulled it out from the internet just to show. We just did a broad search. And if you look at the ingredient labels of these, um, what we do see is many times they're processed along with some other grains, whether it's the corn or whether it's the rice or the tapioca. It's always in combination of something. And, and, and I'll get to the point why that happens. Um, all right, so when we first talk about functional differences in varieties and how it impacts the, the processing okay, and the end use quality. That's what we'll do first. So let's think about a product, a finished product, and from a, from a production standpoint for the industry, you always look at, okay, let's make the best quality of the finished product we can that, they, that the consumers love and crave for. Um, because that is ultimate goal, whether the consumers like the nutrition, but they also like, they will give a high preference for uh, texture and sensory aspects of it. So your goal for the company or somebody selling the product is to make sure the product is uh, good quality and it is has some variability because it's agricultural material, uh, but what is acceptable variability? So they need to have that um, in mind when they process something. So you start with the flour, and you try to figure out what is a good quality, um, and then you process it, right, to get the product. But you also have to keep in mind um, that the raw materials vary quite a bit, whether it's between the varieties or from a growing season to another growing season, um, or growing location, or, you know, let's say the weather conditions were not good one year, the quality changes too, right? So this, there is a variability in the raw material that will dictate how the finished product comes out to be. But let's say if we lock down on a particular variety um, that is giving us a good product, um, then also within that there is a, a, a reasonable level of variability that the process can accept. So 
what happens is the process you are using to process some ingredient, some ingredient into a product, whether it's baking or, or extrusion or some other process, that process has some ability to overcome the variability that comes through the raw material. And, and that's what this slide is showing. Okay. So what we can gain from this slide is, you know, we, we always have to think about what quality does the raw material bring and whether that quality is consistent enough to produce a product that is of consistent quality for the consumer. All right, so what, now let's look at the quinoa. Um, so this data is from the literature. So if you look at the, the composition or the proximate composition, um, there is a, a quite a bit of variation. So I'm gonna just pick one here, uh, the starch, where is if we have seen data from 54, 55% to 65%. That's a 10% different difference in starch um, that has been reported on different varieties of quinoa. Um, and that is quite a bit. Um, and here, for example, the protein as well, protein is generally higher for quinoa and it varies from 12 to 15%. Um, but in, in comparison with corn, that's about 10%. That's a whole corn. And for a soft wheat, it's about uh, close to 10% as well. Okay. Um, now, when it comes to the quality of the grain for using in the end products, it's not just the composition that matters, right? So it also has to function a certain way, whether it's a uh, it's gelling property or solubility um, or other properties, it's melting characteristics. Those matter quite a bit when it comes to end use, uh, along with, of course, the composition. The composition helps you with the nutritional claims, but the functional characteristics help with the making of the product and trying to deliver the right texture for it. So we did a small study. Um, there's a reference for it. Uh, Nicole did this, uh, led this work. She was a student here. And what she did was she took 28 varieties that were grown uh, in the U.S. in the Pacific Northwest that uh, Kevin's lab um, gave us. And she measured this proximate composition and the functional properties. Okay. So these were the list of the uh, composition. These were some of the thermal and um, pasting characteristics, and these were some of the other functional characteristics. So when she did all this, um, here's some of the data that we see. Okay? I just pulled out a couple data points here. This is about uh, pasting characteristic. So when we ran all these varieties, and you can see how <clears throat> the viscosity of these materials from different varieties are, are so significantly different. Um, here at the very bottom, that's the Temuco variety and the Blanca is on the top. And this viscosity, so if I look at the y-axis here, that's about 350 to 400 um, millipascal seconds and the lowest one is around 100. And that will, if you imagine processing these two varieties um, for making a soup, for example. Um, this one, the Blanca will be so thick, the soup will texture will be very different compared to <clears throat> the Temoku variety. So that's something that we should consider when it comes to processing the varieties into uh, the end uses. So a uh, company who, let's say, buys this variety for the first year, and for some reason they don't have a supply for this for the second year, and they have to use this one, then their quality of the food product goes down tremendously, right? So that's why it's important to make sure that the quality of the raw material is uh, consistent. <clears throat> and this one here, we just picked uh, four different um, representations. Essentially, we took the data here and divided it into four groups based on their thickness or pacing characteristics. And these are the representative varieties from those four groups. So what's important about <clears throat> this data is it tells us how this product will be when you put it into a food product. Uh, like whether it's a soup, whether it's a bread, or whether it's an extrusion, extrusion pot. So very quickly, <clears throat> so what Nicole did in her work was she took all that data for 28 varieties um, and measured all those properties and ended up classifying them into four different clusters based on the similarities in the quality for the varieties. And, and you can see on this screen, uh, see she got in to the point where it was C1, uh, cluster one, cluster two, and a three and a four. Um, 
And based on the functionalities associated with each cluster, the conclusions we made were <clears throat> the cluster one varieties were more ideal for baking, um, for example, breads. And cluster two were more <clears throat> ideal for making something that is more like an, uh, cakes or uh, more foamier products in baking. That's what they were more useful for. Um, and then uh, cluster four were more ideal for making noodles. And the cluster three was what we found was, would be more ideal for making uh, extruded products, whether it's noodles, pasta, whichever is made by extrusion process, and breakfast cereals, uh, where we use the, the characteristic of puffing of the product. So, so it can tell you that, you know, um, just from 28 varieties, uh, there might be a significant differences among each one of those um, based on their functionality, uh, even though the nutrition, nutritional value might be very close. All right, so in another study I'll show you right now is how the variety and also the pre-processing of those varieties when we make the flowers <clears throat> impacts the finished product. So uh, a quick study here was to look at uh, cherry vanilla and black. These were the two varieties that we selected. And they, those came from Lundberg Farms. Um, and within these, we were able to get some that were, yes, stands for scarify or scarification where they remove the saponins and U.S. stands for the unscarified version. So we looked at impacts of scarification, but also we got a, a, the Bolivian Royale uh, from Andean Naturals, um, and one of them was with saponin removed, that's why it's called scarified, and the other one is D-germ, that means you removed that uh, uh, surface layer where the fiber is, right? So this particular uh, flower would, would essentially have less fiber. So we took all these and then extruded them to see how they can they puff, um, how can they be useful for making snack type products, snacks or breakfast cereals. And that's some examples here. Okay? And those of you who are not familiar with extrusion, it is widely used for making uh, ex breakfast cereals or uh, snacks. Uh, if, if you ever had any breakfast cereals off the shelf, um, and any snacks, most likely that was made on, a, on an extruder. Typically, you put in the raw material, it comes out of the, the other end of the system, but it cooks in the system and under a lot of pressure and shear, and once the pressure is released, the material puffs, and that's why you get the light density uh, products. Okay. All right, so here is the picture of uh, the products that we got from uh, from the varieties that were tested, so black and cherry vanilla, and this is uh, Bolivian Royal. And again, uh, yes stands for scarified, US stands for unscarified version, um, and only for the Bolivian Royal we had the de-germed version, so that's the DG stands for de-germed. Okay. All right. So if you look at just the scarified versions um, from all three varieties you will, you see automatically, I mean, there's a very, very clear difference in how they puff. Uh, the Bolivian Royale did puff really well, um, much more so compared to the black variety and the cherry vanilla. And down here is the, the number that shows the diameter of this uh, strand that comes up. And obviously these products are not uh, seasoned, uh, so that's why they don't look like a, a fully, you know, fully made snack. Okay. Um, but we're looking at the how well it pops here. Uh, and so the, between the varieties, there is a significant difference um, in the expansion. Now, if you look at the unscarified versions only, um, they, the, the cherry vanilla actually expanded better uh, than the black variety. So just by doing that modification of removing the saponins from it, actually the cherry vanilla performed better. Um, so this, this also tells you how, um, what pre-processing you do to the pr uh, variety impacts how it extrudes, how, or how, it, how you can make a product out of it. All right, so this uh, slide here shows you the expansion values. So on the y-axis is the expansion ratio. So in the previous slide I showed you the numbers were higher and here you see the numbers lower. That's only because um, in this, it's the ratio of 
that number you saw in the previous slide divided by the diameter of the die that it came out of. And that's why the ratios are lower, right? Okay? Um, but you can look at the relative ratios in this slide. On the y-axis is the moisture content, and the moisture content is increasing. That means that's the moisture that we put it into the extruder along with the flour so that it changes the quality of it, right? So we found that at 20%, these varieties, all of these varieties did pretty well at the 20% moisture level. The lower did not uh, resulted in lower expansion, and the higher also resulted in lower expansion. And this is very typical. So 20% is more of an optimum uh, moisture for these. But if we just look at the 20%, and you can see here um, the black varieties, right, um, they have higher expansion, uh, whereas the cherry vanilla has a lower expansion. Um, in case of the black variety, the scarified version actually is higher expansion, and the cherry vanilla, the scarified version, is lower expansion compared to the unscarified. And that's really unique. Um, that's worth looking at where, okay, how is the saponin content will impact the, um, the end product quality. Okay. And then uh, just to see why we were seeing these differences, uh, we looked at the uh, let's look at the pasting characteristics for these. And you can see the black variety is a little bit lower, um, and, and this is with the saponin content. And then the cherry vanilla is a little bit higher. And now if you look at the Bolivian Royale, the functionality here so tremendously different. The green line is for the, uh, the, the whole seed, um, and the, the other line, the orangish line, it, this is more for the um, de-germ. So when you de-germ something, you remove all that fiber. That means there's a lot of starch in it, and that means it'll puff better. Um, so that's what we ended up seeing in this one. But in general, the Bolivian Royale actually was our best expansion, and if you compare just the green line with this data here, so all of these are below 300, but the Bolivian Royale came up to like 500. So the higher the viscosity, the better the puffing is what we saw. And, and here, this slide just shows you uh, the composition numbers. When we look at the protein content for the black uh, variety and then compare that with the scarified variety, you can actually see um, that, you know, the unscarified is very similar, okay? Um, but for only when we scarified the cherry vanilla, the protein content went up. So probably when the scarification process was done, um, probably that scarification happened more so for cherry vanilla that could have resulted in the higher expansion. But one important point that we note in here is the protein content really does not correlate to the functionality. So the composition for protein content does not correlate to functionality. All right, so now let's look at the uh, only the Bolivian Royale. If you look at the DGEM and the uh, regular, the whole grain one, the d -germ has significantly much higher expansion compared to the uh, the one that was not d -germ. And, and this data shows up here as well. Um, for, in this case, the 15% moisture content was giving us a better um, expansion. So you can see that d um Bolivian Royale had a super good expansion. And that means the product will be more um, crispier, lighter, um, and and thus probably the consumers would like this product more uh, than these other ones. Um, and that's for making more of a puffy product. But when it comes to something you want to make a noodle, um, then the other ones uh, might be better, so the ones that was not de -germed. So this is a comparison again between the two. Um, and when we look at the the composition data though, we do see a significant reduction in the protein content and also a significant increase in the starch content and also a significant decrease in the fat content. And you can see that when we remove that outer layer, the fiber goes down uh, tremendously. So a whole grain variety uh, in extrusion does result in lower expansion relative to the de germed variety. Um, that's, the, that's what we can conclude from this. Um, but probably 
you know, if you degerm all the varieties, they will still perform differently um, because, again, the functionality of the starches uh, and the protein that is left over will be different. Um, so that's kind of what we conclude from this is the individual varieties, um, the functionality of those individual varieties uh, generally have a bigger effect on how the finished product will turn out. So in conclusion, uh, what we can conclude from the data that we have so far, I just showed you a little bit of the data. Um, what we are seeing consistently is there is a significant variation in the composition or the nutritional values, and also there is a significant differences in the functional properties. And often, so more often, the composition is not directly related to functionality. Okay, that, that might sound a little uh, conflicting, but, but that's generally what we find uh, for most of the time, that the composition is not related to functionality. And that's why uh, what, what we have concluded so far is it is beneficial to include functionality of the varieties, um, of the flowers from those varieties, as a criteria for releasing new varieties into the market. Because that will help if the industry who is trying to use these varieties, if they understand that, oh, uh, variety X will be more useful for me to make, um, um, let's say, a noodle-type product, then I don't need to try, you know, all the varieties to figure out which variety is more useful for me to make the noodle, right? So that's that's really what we feel we should do uh, early stage before we release the varieties as to what are these varieties more ideal for. Um, and the clustering data or the clustering of the varieties, uh, what we found was more helpful uh, to, f to correlate those varieties to the NDS applications just because of the sheer number of varieties or breeding lines uh, that, that we, we have in the works uh, by, by all the uh, different groups around the world. And, and of course, uh, research is still needed to really understand the performance of individual varieties in the standard processes. So I showed you only one, um, one study on extrusion, but I think there's a lot of need to understand how these uh, varieties perform in other pro standard processes that are used in the industry, whether it's for baking or, or whether it's compounding process just to make the, the, the uncooked noodles, or whether it's for making, you know, fried products or other extruded products. We, we need to understand how the different processes impact the functionality. So that's, in, in, in just what I wanted to convey. Uh, with, with that, I'll, uh, that's my conclusions for this presentation. And then I just wanted to show you uh, some of the references that, that were used in this uh, presentation. And these are some of the publications that came out of our, our team uh, here in Poland. And also, I would like to acknowledge all the students. I tried to list here uh, the, the various students who worked specifically on the quinoa projects that we have um, had over the last uh, four to five years. And also, uh, these pictures, you can see that this, uh, this was, uh, the bottom one was from uh, five years ago, and this one was about three years ago. And I need to update the, with the more um, recent pictures as well, because there's quite a few people who work, who have been working on um, the quinoa projects. Also, would like to thank uh, Lundberg Family Farms and Andean Naturals for providing the uh, the seeds when we need them, um, and also for uh, Kevin and his team um, for all the collaborations that we have. Um, and finally, our uh, food processing team as well. Okay. And this here is just a, a snapshot or a picture of uh, the extruder that was used in the study. Uh, this is one of the instruments that we use uh, in the food processing laboratory. All right, with that, I would like to thank uh, all of you for listening and also thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to do this presentation. All right, so I would like to open it all up to questions. It looks like we have a few populated, and so this will be for Gurish. 
We'll wait Muy for bien. Sandra to translate. Me gustaría abrir ahora la discusión para algunas preguntas. Parece que ya tenemos algunas. So what's been upvoted here is from Anonymous. Um, una que por la que votaron ustedes es de un participante anónimo. They ask, what is the process for degerming the Bolivian Royale? Y pregunta, ¿cuál es el proceso de degerminación para la variedad royal de Bolivia o Bolivia royal? You want me to go? Yep, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yeah, that question uh, is a good question. So I, I, I don't know what they did, Bolivian Royal. So it depends on the companies. Maybe they are in a better situation to answer that question. But what I can tell in general is the, the degerming process is a physical process. Uh, to remove a thin layer so you can essentially have two surfaces like a grinding surfaces uh, that rub against you know the, the grains that go through it so it's a physical separation of the uh, surface layer Sorry, bueno pues esta es una muy buena pregunta en realidad yo no sé qué hacen otras compañías o cómo lo hacen otras compañías para esta variedad específica pero lo que yo les puedo decir es que es un proceso manual, es un proceso artesanal. Y en ese proceso más o menos se despegan dos capas de la semilla. Entonces, eh, eso es un proceso muy laborioso, muy delicado, en el que se quitan por separado las dos capas. Fantastic. We'll move on to the next question by Supun Fernando. Bueno, fantástico. Vamos a seguir con otra pregunta de Supun Fernando. The first one from him is any specific reason regarding starch of quinoa for having two peaks in the RVA profile. Bueno, y la pregunta es, ¿hay alguna razón específica por la que eh, el harina de la de la quinoa o la harina refinada de la quinoa para tener dos puntos o dos picos el p1 y el p2 en relación a, a el se me olvidó la palabra lo siento mucho al a la RBA, que es como el, como se conocen estas, estas, estos dos picos. Uh, that one probably was a tough one to translate. Um, uh, so the question is on why there's two peaks. That is true. Um, we have seen that very consistently for any quinoa variety that we have measured the pasting profiles, they have been um, having two peaks. But if you compare that with the corn or other like tapioca rice, you get the first peak and then it goes down and then comes back up, right? So in case of uh, quinoa, it just keeps going up. So that's what we call a C-type profile. That is a very characteristic of uh, Starch. Muy bien, pues esta es una pregunta un poco difícil. Si me pregunta por la razón por la que estos eh, se presentan estos dos perfiles en la, en la extracción del almidón de la quinoa, el P1 y el P2, yo le puedo decir que en realidad toda la quinoa o todos los tipos de quinoa presentan estos dos perfiles, se pueden ver estos dos perfiles. And I forgot the last part. Uh, Dr. Ganjal, oh, yeah. can you repeat it? Um, so, no, I forgot what I said the last part. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was not only me. <laughs> we can move so, on to this. Um, well, let me just add a couple points. So basically what I meant to say was, 
the chema has a profile, what we typically call in the pasting world as a C-type profile. Okay. And that is very much characteristic of the chema varieties. Okay, pues déjeme decirlo de otra forma. La quinoa tiene eh, dos perfiles, es lo que llamamos um, perfiles eh, característicos. Eh, y entonces, eh, estos son los, los dos perfiles comunes que tiene. All right, we will take a look at the next upvoted question from Evan Crane. Vamos a continuar con la siguiente pregunta más votada. Eh, la hizo Evan Crane. He asks, how might the starch gelatinization temperature of quinoa change the following sprouting or molting? Okay. Y la pregunta es, ¿cómo es que puede la gel gelatinización eh, de la harina de la quinoa eh, o la temperatura de la gelinitización cambiar el, el, la um, germinación o el malteado. So when you Pre, it's as good as pre-processing the quinoa. So when you take the quinoa, you sprout it or malt it, what you're doing is you're breaking down the starch granule in, from its original form. You're going to take that granule and break it up in small pieces. So obviously your gelatinization temperature will go down, but the viscosity still remains pretty good. Okay. So in realidad, lo que usted hace cuando hace el proceso de germinación o de mal, o malteado, si es que así lo puedo llamar, estoy diciéndolo correctamente, eh, es que um, eh, di, divide esa quinoa en partículas muy pequeñas, en partes muy pequeñas. Entonces, con el eh, proceso de la germinación o el germinado, va a bajar la temperatura. All right, and then the next upvoted question is from Junda Jang. Bueno, y entonces en la siguiente pregunta más votada que hizo Junda Jang. He asks, do you think there is an environment effect on functionality? ¿Usted cree que hay un efecto medioambiental en la funcionalidad? Yeah, so in the, of the testing we have done recently, we were uh, some new data that has come out. I mean, we haven't published yet, but we are seeing differences in the quality when it's grown in different locations. Um, and also year to year, we see some differences, but the extent of the difference is not as much when you compare from variety to variety. So variety to variety is more difference, but within the same variety, when you have different environment, uh, that difference is not as significant as between the varieties. Muy bien, pues sí, en las últimas investigaciones que hemos hecho, nosotros nos damos cuenta que sí, el lugar donde se cultiva la quinoa tiene efectos. Pero estos efectos son más notorios dependiendo de la variedad de la quinoa. Uh, eh, si estamos hablando, por ejemplo, de una misma variedad, entonces el, el efecto que se puede ver en esa misma variedad con relación al clima o a la altura eh, o a cualquier otro factor de medio ambiente no es tan relevante como entre variedades. Fantastic. And Chris, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and join Slack at some point today so that we can post these remaining questions over there and continue the conversation. Bueno, fantástico. Yo les voy a pedir que por favor eh, vayan a nuestro canal de Slack para que ustedes puedan ver las respuestas a estas preguntas más tarde. 
como no tenemos tiempo, entonces las preguntas que no se responden aquí en vivo van a estar eh, respondidas más adelante en este canal de Slack. Así que allá pueden encontrar las respuestas a estas preguntas. Great, and I am going to go ahead and start playing Sergio's talk. Muy bien, y entonces vamos a continuar eh, reproduciendo eh, la charla o la presentación que nos trae Sergio para el día de hoy. Hello and good morning. Bienvenido a todos to the end use quality and processing, procesamiento y calidad del producto final session here at the International Quinoa Research Symposium. My name is Abba Kaiser with the WSU Food Systems Program, and it is my distinct pleasure to be welcoming you to this session with Sergio Nunez de Arco, co-founder and CEO of Andean Naturals. Sergio co-founded Andean Naturals in 2004 with the goal of promoting sustainable agriculture and raising farmer incomes in his native Bolivia while giving U.S. consumers reliable access to a nutritious, gluten-free pseudo-grain, quinoa. He focuses on providing a farm-to-market bridge that reduces risk for U.S. food purveyors and raises farmer incomes. In November 2013, Time magazine dubbed Sergio the king of quinoa, placing him amongst the top flight chefs, food activists, and cookbook authors in the article 13 Gods of Food, People Who Influence What and How You Eat. Sergio holds a BS in Political Economy of Natural Resources from the University of California, Berkeley, and he's a wonderful host and a gracious friend. We like to welcome you. Thank you, Sergio, for being here. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm going to go through a facility tour and then talk about different types of quinoa seeds, the processing that sure. undergoes to get them to the best quality possible, and also touch on some... Um... Hi, Sergio, are you having issues with connectivity? I think so. Can you guys hear me right now? Yes. All right. Yes, I just couldn't see myself, uh, but... Uh, if you guys can see, I'm good. Yeah, we can we can see and hear you. Um, but if you can maybe open up your Zoom screen to full screen, that might help uh, with your on your end. Is that better, right there? We're able to see everything. Is it good on your end? Yes, perfect. Great. Applications for quinoa different products that uh, we're seeing on the market. Um, so I am the product line lead for um, Arden Mills, actually the annex by Arden Mills. And um, I've been on the, on the quinoa um, adventure for the past uh, 16 years now. And uh, so it's been my passion for a while and uh, I've visited a lot of processing plants. Um, actually, my first plant was even before starting um, Andean Naturals. So I founded Andean Naturals in 2004. But the very first processing plant that I visited was when I was um, on my first job at the United Nations. And this was in 1996. And I visited the first uh, processing plant then. Um, it was a United Nations uh, per, uh, project at Anapki in Bolivia. And I saw the very first uh, quinoa polishers and wash line, and they're even setting up a solar drying system. So that was uh, very exciting. And then years later, I got the chance to visit uh, many Bolivian exporters that we uh, sourced from. Um, I visited Peruvian exporters. I visited um, Ecuadorian exporters. And when I talk about exporters, it's usually the processing plant is also the exporter. So usually processors and exporters are the same, although they're in some cases exporters that subcontract, in which case um, I, mean, I would have probably seen 15 to 16 different processing plants uh, throughout South America. Um, we also built a facility in Bolivia and built um, this facility in the United States in uh, Yuba City, California. So I'm very happy to give you a quick tour um, I filmed this walking through 
and we're speeding up uh, certain areas so you don't have to see me walking and holding the camera. So this is the best we can do uh, virtually. I wish I could take you all to visit the, uh, the plant and give you a tour and explain what everything is live, but um, considering all situations, I think we're gonna have to do with uh, the tour. So let's go ahead and start with the Andean Naturals um, uh, plant. So this is the outside. We, uh, we have that beautiful quinoa stalk logo, which uh, we're very proud of. So we painted it nice and big up in front. You can see it as you, as you get uh, close to the building. So this is the main uh, production building. And as you can see, it's got uh, two truck docks and another two truck docks right there. The main office is on this side. And here we're gonna go into the uh, production area. So that's actually the bag house, we call it. So that's a system that aspirates every single piece of equipment to keep the dust down. Quinoa is pretty dusty. Of course, um, it's a BRC certified facility, so you have to uh, follow good manufacturing practices, wash your hands, head covering, and at Arden Mills, uh, safety is one of our values, so we definitely um, make sure that everybody's got a helmet, boot protection. You, you'll, you'll notice all the protective equipment. Here's as you walk into the main plant, the pack room, we're gonna get a better view from above but this is the, the, say, finished product area where you'll see uh, one pack line. This is an automated pack line. That is the semi-automated pack line, and that's the bulk pack line. So for bigger bags from Super Sacks, 25 pounders. And that's the lab. Now we're gonna go down the stairs and take a look at the fast pack line. So this, we call it an automated pack line where you feed the bags and the machine will take each bag, will um, spray a lot code on them so you can uh, have traceability. It will um, open the bag, blow some air uh, into it, make sure it's nice and open so it can receive the dumped quinoa that you can see right there as it dumps the right weight of quinoa. So this is 12 ounce to 16 ounces, or even up to four pounds, and then it gets packed. Um, after the bag is sealed, obviously, um, it's a, a heat seal. And um, we also, for bigger bags, so something that might not fit on the automated line, you have a semi-automated line, which is a lot more manual. And this is where we might pack odd size bags or something that our automated line can't uh, pick up. Um, in this case, we have um, a four and a half pound bag, um, and you can see there's uh, two lines feeding the metal detector. So all lines at the end are metal detected. So that's something that you do at the very end of the process. Uh, here we're walking to the bulk line that I mentioned. So the bulk line, has a magnet up up there on top where my my finger is there that's a magnet grate and the product drops through a metal detector into uh, you can have a one ton super sack or you can deviate the fall to another pack line which will do 25 pounders or 50 pounders again you have that tunnel which is a metal detection and the different bags are filled with some metal. So 1.5 millimeters fares, non fares and two millimeters stainless steel would be what we put inside those bags to test that the metal detector actually works or to verify it, 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 it works. So, um, so every set amount of time we'll test um, and uh, make sure the metal detector is working. Now we're gonna go into the bulk cleaning line now, this is where most of the work happens, and you have two stages. The rough cleaning, which is this, this tower where you would bring in field cleaned quinoa, and it drops down here to a little plate magnet, and then it's carried up um, uh, this tube, which is a cable conveyor. So there's little plates that push the quinoa up uh, to the top of this tower where there's a scalper sifter and then you see a gravity table there with a de-stoner. 
Now we're gonna go up here because from here I really like this view of the final cleaning. So this is the last stage of the process where you take quinoa from 99% pure to 99.995 and higher. So the quinoa that already went through the rough cleaning and desaponification will go up this elevator to the cable conveyor, to an aspirator to take out dust, to a desoner, up this elevator to a magnetic separator, an optical sorter, which also has a resorting line. And once the quinoa has been sorted a couple times for color, shape, size, um, it'll go through an aspirator, a double screener, and then after the double screener, I'll go to the other side. The rejects are down there at the bottom. And um, this is our desaponification room. And we can't show you that because that's actually all of our proprietary technology of how we take off the saponin, which I'll describe here shortly. But um, going back a little bit, the rough cleaning. So this is a view from the first tower. The rough cleaning is really taking off the bigger stalks, twigs, and then a gravity table for lights, heavies, and a destoner. And then the saponin is taken off. And finally, the premium clean that you, you just saw. Of course, the, um, really the brains of the operation is uh, an uh, infrared camera equipped optical sorter with 256 scanners that have little air guns, 256 of them, that will be shooting hundreds of times per second. Um, after the product's been cleaned and packed, it goes to the finished product warehouse, where you can see it being wrapped there. So that's a retail product that's um, being wrapped prior to shipment. And I'll actually show you how it's loaded onto a truck here pretty shortly. So there's some more product, and you can see the warehouse is just huge and filled with both bulk quinoa that's ready to go and retail packed product. So we're just gonna go walk all the way to the back, past the racks, to the loading bay, where the product that you just saw packed and wrapped is now being loaded onto a truck. Um, we can see uh, how it gets loaded onto a truck right here, and then it's ready to go. And now we're gonna walk slowly, actually pretty fast here through, uh, you can see Colorado quinoa here. That's all clean product from um, our Colorado farmers, but there's also fair trade Bolivian quinoa, there's Peruvian quinoa, uh, there's our raw material storage that we just saw. But now we are walking up to the lab where the, um, our lab technicians are going to show, show us really quickly how um, they control the quality of the, the, the product. So this is after a rough clean. After the rough clean, you can see there's still some organic material and still some twigs that they're finding on after the rough clean. So it needs to go to the premium clean to take off those last little bits of foreign material. And of course, the second step is the desaponification. So we're gonna test that the saponin has been taken off to um, the right levels. And the way we check this is uh, through a foam uh, um, test. So you take uh, five milliliters of distilled water and you'll weigh out a certain amount of quinoa which then gets poured into that test tube and then shaken for about um, 30 seconds and you let it rest 20 seconds. So um, Carmen is putting the, the timer on. We're gonna speed it up um, so that she, uh, that's, that was a moisture meter that we showed while she was shaking it. And uh, here we, we're gonna see how she measures out the, uh, the foam. So she um, lets it wait for about 20 seconds for the foam to settle, and then um, she will measure. So just to give you a reference, when the quinoa is raw, it'll be eight centimeters. We're not talking millimeters, and here we're talking three millimeters. So if it's below three millimeters, we know that it's below 26.6 milligrams per gram of saponin, which is acceptable. This is a quick guide on the various foreign materials that we find in quinoa. So all each one of these is a foreign seed. 
So we can find canola seeds, mustard seeds, uh, amaranth seeds, um, but what um, some of the, the most common here are on the page. So this is a reference from our quality control technicians uh, where they'll collect the foreign materials that they find. And uh, you can see here hard stones. Um, you can see volcanic stones. The interesting thing about volcanic stones is they're lightly magnetic. So you can separate them on the magnetic separator. Quartz stones are the most dangerous because they look like broken glass. So we target those with an infrared camera. The sticks and twigs, the little stems of the quinoa are the most common. But these light uh, volcanic stones are very difficult because they're light, they're light colored, um, very difficult so, to remove. So magnetic separators are the best. Organic matter, of course, is um, something that we target throughout the process. Could be bug larvae. Um, uh, the stones, rocks, you can remove through the um, destoners. We have redundant destoners, so it'll go through a couple of destoners to make sure that um, as it get, hits the last one, there's no more rejects. Here you can see um, that's what the stalks look like, and they're very, very small, two millimeters. Um, this one I really wanted to focus on because it's uh, something that really we really struggled with, and we'll find this in Bolivian quinoa specifically, but sometimes on Peruvian. And actually, interestingly, there's some quartz in Colorado. So that summarizes the quick tour, which, if you can remember, was broken out into three parts. So when you take the quinoa, the first part is getting rid of the big foreign material. The big foreign material are those sticks and twigs. Um, I'm gonna go back to that that lab um, that lab uh, picture. So the big foreign material, the sticks and twigs, and of course any bigger stones. On the first one, that's what you're targeting. Uh, you'll also look at um, the those big seed pods, so anything large. And for that, you just need a, a, a scalper, a sifter. We'll separate any dust, but also larger form material. And then you, you want to separate by gravity. So you're going to take anything that's very light, including quinoa seeds that don't have um, a starch core because uh, Interestingly, and we see this especially in North America, ligus bugs will go in and tap into the center of the quinoa seed and suck out the starch. So you have little discs that don't have any starch in it. And we separate those with a gravity table. We also separate very small quinoa seeds as well as very small foreign seeds. We can uh, get some canola as well. And uh, the middle cut of the gravity table is usually very good, so that will keep going. And the heavy cut, which means the heavier of the, um, the foreign material, will have both quinoa, the big nice seeds, but also some stones. So we run those through a, a destoner, and once the heavy cut's clean, it goes back into the gravity table for continuing on to the process. So I mentioned um, the room where I had the uh, the hand, which is a desaponification. De de so on the desaponification, de de what you're really looking at is removing the saponin, which is a, um, a covering on the quinoa. Uh, I will see if I have a very nice picture of the covering here. Um, you, can, you can see a little bit of the covering of the seed right here. Um, so what we're targeting is how do you remove the bitter covering that uh, is on the quinoa seed? And this covering might be um, harder or softer depending on the variety. There might be more or less. Um, it might rub off very easily or it might be harder to rub off. And in some cases, it's actually not bitter at all. So you can just, uh, just keep it with the saponin covering. So there's some uh, saponin-free varieties out there that we've uh, we've worked with. On most of um, the plants, what they'll do is they'll take the seed, they'll run it through a scarifier, which is a modified rice polisher, 
and then you'll take it to a washer where the quinoa is sloshed around about one pound of quinoa to two gallons of water so you can see a lot of water being used here and then it goes through a, a rinse step where the quinoa will um, the dirty water will rinse through and clean water will rinse the quinoa and then it goes to a dryer for about 20 minutes 190 degrees Fahrenheit so you have that dry quinoa at about 12 percent moisture target that process is intensive in heat and intensive in water um, when Andean Naturals became part of Arden Mills Arden Mills worked on a new process which is a um, very low water process we use a thousandth of the water that we used to use so a thousand times less and the process involves a very uniform friction so the equipment um, that we had access to before was rough in the sense that it's like taking a little sandpaper and sanding the corners so you can sand a little bit and then you need to wash to get rid of the rest the little patches that are here and there uh, inevitably you end up with a few patches that are not washed um, now with very uniform polishers these modern polishers you can get a very uniform and also you can measure how much you want to get into without hitting the starch core so I'm going to show you a picture of what happens I don't know if you can see the quinoa germ which is the the plant that's wrapped around the core so as soon as water touches the quinoa this germ will sprout and it's very fragile so if you're not careful it'll break off here it's intact here it's broken off this when cooked will absorb a lot of water and will actually um, become like you see here just open starch and you will lose this little um, uh, it's like the embryo of the plant we call it the germ so very important to be careful as far as the abrasion and so um, the new process will then take the lightly abraded seed add some water but the amount of time and the uniformity of the application of water and then um, we quickly rub off that water with a strong airflow so that um, the water doesn't have time to penetrate inside the seed so we can use a much less water and um, achieve levels of saponin that we um, target um, and those are based on on the the testing that we both send out to third-party labs or do in-house so this gives you um, an idea of the different uh, processes for taking off the saponin I spoke about the traditional process which is scarification you have uh, some that are scarification followed by a, a, a light polish uh, the danger with that is if your quinoa has a different degree of hardness on the on the saponin coating and you're not controlling your seed stock that you're planting with it's very likely that you're going to have varying results on your end product so um, for us when working with smallholder farmers we need something that's flexible enough uh, to um, to adapt to their biodiverse seeds so we have one system going in Bolivia and the systems that we have where there's seed uniformity and uh, um, less varieties and more controlled saponin coatings like the ones in North America we can use um, the low water systems so that gives you a broad overview and um, what I'd like to do now is just go over some samples so you can all see the different types of quinoa because it's exciting to see um, Colorado European uh, Pacific Northwest varieties with Bolivian and, and uh, the Peruvian and the different colors so I think um, we're gonna zoom into the different samples we brought here to show you so I wanted to show a few samples here that we brought um, of course you have the traditional Bolivian white and the Peruvian white which um, today in the market they make up most of the market so between the two it's 90 percent of the quinoa market you would see are either Bolivian or Peruvian now um, as we mentioned quinoa is grown elsewhere so you you start having uh, Canadian quinoa coming into the market 
Um, the, there's excellent varieties growing in the uh, Pacific Northwest. Um, let me bring up uh, the traditional cherry vanilla, which grows really well. You can see it right there. And um, the Dutch varieties have done quite well in California. This is a sapin and free variety that you have um, from the Dutch. And uh, of course, the Colorado quinoa, which um, as you can see is quite similar to the origin varieties here. So that's um, the Colorado quinoa. Um, now, each one of these, the, the Bolivian and Peruvian, comes also in, in red, for example. So you'd have the Bolivian red, and you would have the Peruvian red, wh where you can see the differences in color. So um, there's no good and bad quinoa. There's the right quinoa for the right application. Um, the Bolivian's known for just an all-around good side dish application, the Peruvian as well. But we've noticed the Peruvian is excellent in soups, soups, crackers, and uh, IQF applications as well. It is uh, excellent. The, um, the red Bolivian has a higher water absorbency than the Peruvian red. So, and the red colors in general are used more in cold salads. So you have a tricolor blend, which would blend the black color of the Bolivian. So you can have the Bolivian black and the Bolivian red and white into a custom blend. Now some um, quinoa, for example, in Colorado, we have uh, a natural tricolor blend. And um, you can also see in the Pacific Northwest uh, a very similar blend growing there. This is a, uh, a tricolor blend from um, the coast. So what I also wanted to show you is we have um, quinoa that can be crisped. This is, this is a red quinoa crisp. Uh, using Bolivian quinoa. So if you're looking for a bigger crisp, usually you go for the Bolivian. Also, it's, it's um, we'll, as we'll see in uh, uh, the talks on, on, um, um, on quinoa extrusion, the Bolivian does really well. Um, you can see quinoa flour here. Uh, you can mill the white, but if you're getting better yields on a tricolor, you can also mill a tricolor, and the impact on a tricolor powder is very low, as you'll notice here on this flower. So depending on the application, you can ha have a flower that looks more like a whole grain flower, and um, where color is less important, and you might be able to blend um, one of these natural tricolor uh, quinoas into it. Of course, when you're puffing or popping or crisping, you have some germ that is lost. And this is a really interesting up and coming application for, or ingredient for quinoa is a 39% protein quinoa germ powder, or you can, some people call it quinoa brand powder as well. Um, many will be familiar with the quinoa flakes so the toasting of the quinoa on the flakes uh, gives it a nuttier flavor, a little bit less grassy flavor. Oftentimes people um, want to avoid the grassiness that uh, comes from the enzymes and higher heat will deactivate those. Got another minute left. And finally, as we get into uh, even higher value added ingredients, you will see some uh, pre-gel powders. So these, uh, these pre-gel powders will be very, very fine and, um, and um, are ready to eat. They can be used in, um, in smoothies, uh, beverages, uh, and um, we are just excited to see all the research that's being carried out around quinoa and for me, I just can't wait to see the first quinoa protein concentrates hitting the market here soon. Um, so thank you for um, 
just helping me um, share all this uh, with you and uh, let me know if you have any questions. All right, that was a fantastic presentation. Muy bien, esta fue una presentación muy fantástica. We now have 10 minutes for questions, and I will go ahead and select the top upvoted one. Okay, ahora tenemos 10 minutos para preguntas, y voy a empezar seleccionando eh, las por las que ustedes votaron más. Jack Hoagland says, hi, Sergio. <laughs> Jack Hoogland says, hola, Sergio. Does quinoa from Colorado, Bolivia, and Peru target target different segments of the market? Um, la quinoa de Colorado, Bolivia, y Peru um, tienen diferentes segmentos en el mercado o diferentes lugares para el mercadeo. Uh, sí, la, la respuesta es sí. Uh, yo puedo traducir si, si gusta. I, I can just uh, answer the question and translate as we go. Um, if you're okay with that. Whatever you're most comfortable with. Yes, I don't have a problem with that either. Yo no tengo problema con eso. Sí, me avisa si, si algo no, 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 no respondo bien. So just <laughs> pop in if I mess up something. Sometimes my, my... I was born and raised in Bolivia, but I forget sometimes. Uh, so the the question is if the quinoa from Colorado, Bolivia, and Peru target different segments, and it's yes. La quinoa de Colorado, Bolivia, y Peru definitivamente apuntan a mercados y segmentos diferentes. So currently out of Colorado, we have conventional quinoa. And um, from Bolivia, we mainly have organic. And from Peru, you have quite a bit of diversity. You have conventional from the coast and you have organic uh, from the, the high valleys and from the, the Puno area around Lake Titicaca. And so um, de, de, de Colorado is principalmente convencional, de Bolivia is principalmente organica, y de Peru uh, hay convencional de, los, de, de baja altura, cerca de la costa, y como también convencional organica de los valles, y organica de, uh, cerca de la región de, de Puno. Each one of these is, is targeting a different price point, a different application, and a different market. Y cada una de estas quinoa, quinoas tiene un precio diferente, una aplicación uh, diferente, es mercadeada de una manera diferente, y um, entonces definitivamente apuntamos a un nicho diferente. The, the key to, to, to segmentation, where, when um, Jack mentions target different segments, that is the absolute key for holding the smallholder farmer protected as the market for quinoa globalizes. We need to uh, protect the smallholder uh, farmers in the niches where they excel. So we find that they excel at organic agriculture for specific applications where there's a connection between the end user and the farmer. So perfect, for example, for retail side dish applications where you can tell the farmer's story. Vemos que la clave de la diferenciación del mercado es justamente la segmentación, como lo dice Jack aquí. Para proteger al pequeño productor eh, frente a la globalización de la producción de quinoa, se debe segmentar el mercado, por ejemplo, en aplicaciones donde hay una conexión entre el usuario final y el productor, como por ejemplo una bolsita donde se puede contar la historia de la quinoa. Eh, ahí es, es, uh, y también asegurarse de que el pequeño productor eh, eh, compite en el nicho donde excede. Um, that's that's uh, the, the answer. So definitely differentiation is key. Fantastic. There's also a second question that Jack had asked. And that is, what goes into determining how you source from these different places? Entonces, la, la pregunta es, ¿cómo um, eh, uh, sourcing es como nos uh, es como hacemos, tomamos la decisión de compra o aprovisionamiento eh, de, de estos diferentes lugares, ya sea Colorado, Bolivia, Perú, 
Um, so how do we buy from different places? Um, the really easy answer is what is the market asking for? La, la respuesta rápida es ¿qué es lo que nos pide el mercado o el consumidor final? Si alguien viene y me dice quiero quinoa orgánica eh, con una historia de un pequeño productor, yo ya sé que le voy a ofrecer o peruano o boliviana de un cierto lugar. Uh, if, a consumer, if one of our customers comes and says, I want a retail product in a one pound bag with a story, uh, I want it to be organic. Um, and uh, uh, I already know, well, I'm gonna offer them Peruvian organic or Bolivian organic, so Peruvian and Bolivian from the highlands. Pero si alguien viene y me dice, mira, yo quiero quinoa para un cereal, donde la quinoa es 2% del ingrediente y me importa solo el costo. Well, in that case, uh, uh, if someone comes and says, oh, I have a cereal that I'm wanting to sell where quinoa is only 2% of the, of the ingredient and for me, cost is most important. I just want to have quinoa on the label. Well, I already know I'm going to offer either conventional from the coast of Peru, conventional from Ecuador or the Colorado quinoa, depending on the functionality of the ingredient. So is it uh, something that needs to puff? Is it an extruded? Is it, do you need more density? And understanding what the end use is key. Entonces, para mí, en ese caso, yo les ofrecería convencional, por ejemplo, la costa peruana, o convencional de Colorado, o tal vez ecuatoriana. Pero siempre viendo y preguntando un poquito más, ¿cuál es la, necesitas extruirlo? ¿O necesitas más densidad? Tratando de entender más cuál es la aplicación final del producto. So uh, that was the, the, the answer is really the market dictates. Uh, la, la pregunta, la respuesta rápida es, ¿qué es lo que el mercado nos pide? Great, thank you for that fantastic explanation. The next upvoted question is from Aitre Ak Akpakuma asking, what do you think what do you do with the residue containing saponin? Do you think it is possible to promote it as an organic pesticide? La, la pregunta es, ¿qué hacemos con los residuos que contienen saponina y si es posible uh, promoverlos o venderlos como un pesticida orgánico? Um, we currently um, produce probably 20 tons of this per month. Actualmente tenemos más o menos 20 toneladas de este producto. Uh, at our Bolivian facility, uh, we have a sister facility in Bolivia that has zero waste. So 100% of that is uh, goes into compost programs for uh, the farmers. In, in Bolivia tenemos una, una fábrica hermana y allá tenemos cero residuos de la planta, lo que quiere decir que 100% de la, la saponina vuelve al campo para ser uh, incluida en un uh, fertilizante orgánico, es un compost. Um, aquí en Estados Unidos lo donamos a, a, a granjeros que quieren hacer compost, o desgraciadamente si nadie lo quiere tomar, pues lo tenemos que desechar. Here in the U.S., we're also uh, looking to promote it with farmers who want to incorporate it as a fertilizer and in compost, for example, but if not, we have to dispose of it. Um, y la segunda parte de la pregunta es si puede ser un, un pesticida orgánico. Y ahí definitivamente ya hay investigaciones um, sobre el control eh, de, de plagas, sobre todo las uh, linazas. The, there's already studies and actually products that use quinoa saponin for, for slug, uh, control of slugs. Um, and uh, I'm sure there's, there's a lot of research. There's actually a couple of companies who refine the saponin and sell the refined saponin. Y también hay empresas que ya están comprando los residuos de las plantas procesadoras de quinoa y están refinando la saponina para vender un concentrado de saponina. So saponin concentrates will also have a market here coming up as companies buy the byproducts and refine it to have a, a purified saponin. Awesome. That's great. So Evan Crane has a very similar question, or maybe I'm not understanding it, but he's asking, what are the opportunities you see to combine saponin removal via washing with the creation of value-added products? 
I think uh, um, Evan pregunta si hay oportunidades de combinar la, 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 la desaponificación vía húmeda con, con mucha agua con la creación de productos de valor agregado. Um, so Evan, I've, I've always wondered because when I see, we, we, use, we use a lot of water, uh, we used to use a lot of water at our US plant, but we do use a lot of water um, uh, uh, in, in Bolivia in the, in the process. And when you see all that foam and it's very thick foam, so you grab the quinoa foam and you turn it over and it's solid. In Bolivia, estoy describiendo como la espuma de la, la vemos que se utiliza mucha agua y la espuma es super sólida le das la vuelta y sigue pegada. Entonces tiene una tensión que es muy importante. And maybe I shouldn't do this, but I, I'll go ahead and taste it. And it's actually not bitter. Y la pruebo y no es amarga. Entonces hay algo de especial en esa, en esa espuma. Y um, gracias a Dios que estoy con todos ustedes investigadores, porque espero que alguien responda el año próximo a la pregunta que tiene uh, nuestro amigo Evan. Uh, so I thank God that we're here with all the experts because I challenge one of you to figure out uh, the answer to Evan's question. We would love to see what you can do with the, the flow, the water flow that has that, that foam or with the foam of the quinoa. I think the saponin is one of those great untapped values in quinoa and uh, and I hope that we can infuse some passion to the, the people here investigating to come up with a great product. Y espero que les demos la pasión a los investigadores aquí que, 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 que des, descubran un producto excelente que utilice la, la, la saponina de la quinoa porque yo creo que es uno de esos grandes valores que todavía no hemos tocado en la quinoa. Thank you for that nudge for collaboration. That's exactly what we want here at the symposium. So I highly encourage everyone listening to jump on Slack and post in our, our collaboration channel discussing this. Pues muchas gracias a Sergio por darnos ese empujón uh, para eh, trabajar más en este tema. Eh, les pido a todos que por favor vayan al canal de Slack y empiecen a comentar y hablar sobre, sobre el, ideas sobre eh, esta, esta opción o esta, este tema de investigación. Awesome. Well, we do have a little bit of time remaining in this session, but I'm going to give our translator, Sonia, a break. Um, for all of us to, to go to the bathroom and, and drink some water before we move right into the next session. But I would like to thank our speakers today in this session. They are just a wealth of knowledge. Well, um, vamos a darles un descanso y le quiero dar un descanso a Sonia, o sea, a mí, <laughs> para, para que um, um, eh, vayan, eh, no sé, um, tomen agua, vayan al baño, tomen un descanso eh, y les quiero agradecer a todos los presentadores y los participantes y después de este descanso seguimos con más y yo le quiero agradecer a Sergio, su traducción es perfecta, mejor que la mía. No, gracias Sonia, hace un trabajo excelente y estamos, después es un honor de participar en este foro, entonces muchas gracias. A usted, muchas gracias. Awesome, well, Please do all head to Slack to continue this dialogue. All right, thank you. Muy bien, a todos los invitamos al canal de Slack para continuar con este diálogo que traíamos. And thanks to all of you, uh, Julian, Sonia, you guys have done a fantastic job. Thank you. <laughs> I try my best sometimes. Words just fly away my head. You are phenomenal. Thank you for your patience. I will just leave this slide up here for people to read until the next session begins.
Julianne, are you there? I am, yes. Let me Hi. try to share Rick, my Rick video. Jelly, how are you? Good, how are you? Thank you for joining us. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Um, what do I need to do here? Are we, am I going first? Is David going first? I will let Dan speak to that. He is your facilitator. Dan. Yeah, Rick. Um, so in the PowerPoint that has the videos loaded, David is the first one. So would you, would you want to go first or would you prefer to go second or, or do you have a preference? It's six of one and a half dozen of another. I, I really don't care either way. Okay. So okay. just keep it the way it is. That's good. Yeah, yeah, I'm, su I'm sure you were watching yesterday's. <laughs> Jeff and Dave. <laughs> yeah. This is Dave Brenner here. Uh, should I be um, turning on the video or doing anything else right now? Um, when we start the session, I'll ask y'all to turn on your videos. Uh, we'll do a brief introduction and then we'll play the recorded videos. And after each recorded video, um, I'll have you turn on your camera and your microphone uh, so that we can go into a live Q&A. So for the moment, uh, you can just hang tight with your, your camera off and the microphone muted. Uh, and then once we start, we'll cue you to have those turned on. Okie doke. All right, thank you. Fantastic, yeah. At 1.15 is when we will kick it off.
Hi, everyone. Welcome to room two. We are waiting a couple more minutes before we get this session started. We want to make sure that we have our interpreter in the room. Okay, it is 1.15. Just want to make sure we have everyone here. So we have Dan, correct? I'm here. Great, and we have Sonia. Awesome. I am the room host, and I am going to hand over the facilitation of this session to Dan Packer. Muy bien. Uh, yo soy la directora de esta sala, y voy a darle... Aquí las riendas de esta sala a Dan Packer. Dan, do you have a short intro for this or is it embedded within the video? If that's the case, I can go ahead and start. Dan. ¿Tú tienes una pequeña introducción para este video o ya está en el video? Si es así, podemos empezar directamente con el video. It sounds like we're not getting audio from Dan, so I'm going to go ahead and start the first video. Parece que tenemos problemas de audio con Dan, así que voy a empezar con el primer video. Hi Dan, is it all right if I get started or would you like to have a short introduction? Dan, ¿puede escucharnos? ¿Empezamos o usted va a hacer una pequeña introducción? All right, we are going to get started. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all out to the Genetic Resources and Wild Relatives session of the International Chemo Research Symposium. My name is Daniel Packer. I'm a research associate at Washington State University within the Sustainable Seed Systems Lab, uh, and I will be facilitating the session. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Brenner, uh, David is a botanist and curator at a United States National Plant Germplasm System gene bank. He is responsible for many crops, including quinoa, but also amaranth, some millets, sweet clover, parsley dill fennel, and many more at the North Central Regional Plant Introduction Station with Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa. His interests include obscure crops and crop wild relatives. They have useful diversity for improving agriculture and lives. Most of his crops are not adapted in Iowa, so David grows them in a greenhouse to produce fresh seeds for conservation. The seeds are distributed to researchers in support of world agricultural sustainability via the Green Global Public website. With that introduction, Dr. Brenner, the time is yours. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the promotion. I don't actually have a doctorate. I have a master's degree, so uh, My apologies. the doctor is a, a small promotion. Uh, but I'll start right in. Um, so I work at the national in part of the United States National Plant Germplasm System, and at a at a gene bank we have a huge one core, and this is the part of it where the key podium seeds are. It's about 300 jars, and uh, we distribute seeds worldwide. So we get a seed order. I approve the seed order. Someone goes to these jars or the pre-packed packages, and packages them up to send out. And today I'm going to talk about the collection in general, um, so something about seed anatomy, which uh, I've been exploring as a way of uh, solving seed dormancy problems, and some novel kinds of kinopodium. Then I'll finish with a few references that may be useful for you to continue with if you want to explore this more. 
So this is my greenhouse and the plastic tents are to control pollen and I use approximately the same system, same tents for amaranth, for millets, for various other things that I grow in uh, the winter. So my plants are almost all short day. They need short days in order to flower and uh, that's what all the black curtains are up for to keep the long daylight from other greenhouse users away. So we have 290 available accessions, uh, 144 quinoa, and uh, we can send them worldwide without restrictions about intellectual property rights, which is a, a great boon to many researchers in these days. And we're improving our collections of wild species because uh, wild species have a lot of the genetic diversity that's useful for researchers to work with. And we have 55 of the Kinopodium berlandieri, which is a close relative. The collection is about to grow by a big leap with 199 new wild collected Kinopodium donated by Dr. Jellin. And our seeds, as once more, are distributed worldwide for research and development. So with the wild accessions that we're expanding our collections of dramatically, there's a, a problem. Most of the accessions have lots of dormancy. So many times I've planted maybe these 300 seeds in my greenhouse flats and I wait uh, four or five months and nothing at all germinates and I throw the flats away because there's nothing I can do about it. Or I get a small population and sometimes I do better than that, but it's a continual problem. So in 2019, we improved on this dramatically by using um, dissecting needles to crack the seed coat so that they would germinate. And that worked uh, pretty well, but then the overwhelming majority of the seedlings are so deformed by that impact of this dissecting needle that they can't actually germinate or can't actually establish. So they germinate a high percentage, but then the plants are so abnormal, they never establish. Here's an example in this picture of one where that uh, system that we have broke off the root and then the plant germinated. You can see the cotyledons opening up and then the hypocotyl here which is the connection between the stem and the root, was able to uh, regenerate a fresh root, which seems amazing to me, but the, the original root obviously is broken off right here. And uh, this is a comparatively minor issue for our seedlings because most of them had big breaks in the stems or no cotyledons. And in those cases, they can't regenerate at all, can't grow at all. So I got busy with this microscope and uh, working here on this little blocks of uh, paraffin. I like the way I can make little holes in it to hold the seeds and it's a little bit tacky. And we had this seed lot already in storage that I'd grown in 2014 that had 86% dormant and zero normal germinations according to our expert seed analyst. And so it was a, a good test to try and break dormancy with. And I tried various kinds of scarifying, scraping the seed coat in order to induce germination trying to find something that would work a little bit better than the dissecting needle we've been jabbing with them, jabbing them with. And uh, I'll proceed to tell you the story. So after our, our new treatment, we can get about 55% of the seeds from this seed lot to be plants that could establish. And the secret sauce is this micro pile. So in a quinoa or the wild quinoa relatives, the seed is pretty much flat, shaped like a Frisbee. And the the seedling wraps around the very outer edge of the seed. And the bigger lump here is where the root is. And then the cotyledons, you can't actually see them, but they're underneath uh, this seed covering uh, here with the two leaves, cotyledon leaves, wrapped around the, the seed. And so we start out by hydrating the seeds on blotter paper. Then under a microscope, we cut at the micropile, which is the name of this place here. It's the a uh, tender little place where the, the root and the leaf come together and it's where uh, the plant was, the seed was connected to the mother plant when it was a developing seed before maturity. And the other part of our process is to put the seeds in these tea balls like this and put them in a ultrasonic cleaner after scarifying and uh, 60 minutes in tap water, and that's to dispel the dormancy causing hormones such, to, such as acetic acid. Uh, after the hormones are, are, are uh, rinsed out in this, we put the seeds in our germination box, like this one, and put them in a, a growth chamber to germinate. Uh, 
Uh, this is a picture that uh, Rich Allen gave me, and I'm using it to illustrate uh, the plant more the seed morphology. Um, so, in this particular, this is all Chenoparium berlandieri with the characteristic uh, golden brown pericarp. The pericarp is this covering here. It's kind of papery. In some of the species, like quinoa, it falls away immediately, almost before you, you know it. You have pericarp clean seeds, and then others have adherent pericarp like this. So uh, the, you see the seed coat with black underneath, and then this uh, red-brown pericarp. And then this circle here looks like a little volcano is where it was attached to the mother plant. So this is the basal view. We're looking at the bottom of the seed when it was still attached to its mother plant. And the base in these is domed. So they ordinarily fall with the domed base up and then the apical part, the top of the seed, you can see the styles here where it was pollinated from, uh, that ordinarily falls down. Um, so the, the amazing to be discovery, it, I, I started this by cutting just about everywhere I could think of on the seed to see what kind of results would come in the germination. And at long last, I came to this, partly because I'm looking at this thing here. There's a structure that I'm uh, uh, calling the, the funicle that connected from the placenta where it's attached to the mother plant, and this funicle attached here to the micropile where it uh, fed the seed when the seed was growing. And here's uh, more pictures of the same thing. I took these myself with a microscope and a uh, microscope camera. And here's a seed of Chenopodium berlandieri in, uh, in a little pit in some wax. And I've scraped away the pericarp and exposed this funicle, which it, it's like an umbilical cord connecting the mother plant to the micropile down here. And this is a quinoa seed from out of our germplasm collection. It has exactly the same structure and it probably continued further on here when it was uh, a young growing seed and then most of it's broken away as you see it now. But uh, I have never looked at one in a growing quinoa seed and I would like to see it. But uh, I'm, I'm very pleased with myself for discovering this funicle because I couldn't find it anywhere in the literature. I have a, a stack of papers about quinoa seed morphology with beautiful cross sections showing lots of great detail and much better microscopists than myself, but they don't show this structure. So it'd be a great favor to me if someone else knows of a paper that shows it because I'd like to cite it when I go ahead and publish this uh, method for breaking dormancy. And uh, it would be a, a great favor to me if you, if you have a paper like that. And now I'm getting into the part of the talk where I'm talking about uh, novel germplasm in our collection. And uh, this is one of these novel things. I had a small grant to collect germplasm um, in the Tampa, Florida area. And I went to Tampa, Florida because I've been looking at online herbaria, which showed records of uh, Berlin deer that had been collected in the spring, which is counterintuitive here in Iowa, because in Iowa, the wild kinopodiums only grow during the summer and they all mature in the fall. But here was a spring maturing wild kinopodium. And it turns out that at some latitude, the seasons reverse for, for kinopodium and they're winter growing rather than summer growing. And uh, that's why it was available to collect in June. And we have about four or five of these. And uh, Rick Jellin has collected more, including from Texas. And then uh, there are others which he regards as day length neutral from all along the Gulf Coast of the United States. So I'm calling this variety sinuatum, but that's uh, provisional. It, it keyed out as that to me, but it's a little bit out of the range where sinuatum is generally accepted to be. And uh, here's another one of our odd things. This is uh, Kitapodium ahuense from Hawaii. And it's got this uh, marvelous fan-shaped leaf blade and uh, apparently very day length insensitive. It, we harvested it eight months after planting. So we planted in January and generally there's enough short days to cause uh, short day things to flower right away. But this kept growing way into the summer, through the summer and finally flowered in October. And uh, this is a, 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 our only example of this particular species. And 
and uh, we hope to make it available for distribution pretty soon. We already have a seed increase. It just needs to be cleaned a little better. And uh, Ketopodium foraminosum, and I understand Jeff Mon is be, going to be talking about this with his new collaborations in Taiwan, but uh, we have two accessions of this collected by someone in, I think, the 1980s who was really looking for uh, Ceteria, but he collected a couple of these in the mountains in Taiwan. So they're very much like a quinoa. They can, can, you could confuse them with quinoa, but it's a whole different independent domestication with uh, beautiful drooping horsetail-like uh, seed heads. And they're culturally important in Taiwan, and I think especially in these modern times. So you can Google this, and there are a lot of hits where people in Taiwan are now celebrating this as part of their ethnic heritage. And I was able to download this image from online. I attribute the, the source here at this website from some quick My greenhouse are not quite as good as this. And uh, the grain kinopodiums of India. This is a uh, white seeded uh, grain kinopodium pictured here, another of these independent domestications. Uh, apparently, humans were eating wild kinopodiums all over the world, and in a few places, independently, they uh, advanced their hunter gatherer gathering all the way to domesticated types. So, uh, this is a exploit uh, with, with white seeds, and there's a, a beautiful write-up about, write about it by Paul Shukla, 1990. And then uh, there are also tetraploids that were uh, studied in roughly the same part of India. And our accessions of them are all black seeded, even though this publication by Partap describes uh, other seed colors. There's a, a reddish one and uh, a white seeded one. And I got all these, uh, got my seed jars out, all the seed lots to look at as part of preparing for this talk, which was a wonderful learning experience for me because I saw things I didn't even know about that one of our accessions has a few white and red brown seeds. So apparently they are grown in close proximity, sharing genes with the white seeded kinds that we don't really have. But now that I know there's some white seeds, uh, I can try and uh, segregate a separate accession with that trait. So I'm looking for, forward to that little adventure in our greenhouse planting in the fall. And these beautiful red color seeds, uh, this is just one of the accessions that I, that I imaged, and most of them are not this bright. I suppose there are many people at this meeting that have a lot more experience with this species than I do. I've never seen it growing in Mexico, but we have a few accessions and I've grown most of them. And these seeds are so splendid and they're large. It's uh, uh, more than a millimeter, about a millimeter and a half wide. And uh, it just seems as though there should be special opportunities for such a, a pretty seed. And then uh, I think all of these uh, wonderful independent domestications are potential for adaptation in quinoa cultivation. And uh, this is magenta spring. It has beautiful magenta uh, waxy hairs. You can rub them off easily with your thumb. And this is another image that I ordered, that I just downloaded online, but ours look about like this. And we have five of these accessions. I've been wondering what the word spring means, where it comes from. There must be some language that it originated at. But uh, these are in the trade, in the trade, trade in the United States under magenta spring. And uh, it's a, a beautiful vegetable. I personally eat a lot of wild, uncultivated uh, kinopodium leaves. It's, it's, they're a lot like spinach, and these are the same kind of things. Unfortunately, the purple washes off pretty easily when you're washing it, and you'd have to be pretty careful to not wash them off before preserving, presenting it as a salad. And if you're going to cook it, it would probably, uh, the, the purple would be all gone, but they're, they're beautiful plants. And uh, cytoplasmic male sterility. Uh, cytoplasmic male sterility has been a special interest of mine, especially in amaranth, where I've been taking uh, notes of this kind. So I've taken just about all the notes you see reported here. And I've grown, uh, so I grow all these accessions. And each time I grow them, 
I look for male sterility, which is uh, visible as uh, a whiskery looking long exerted style where they're not pollinated and the style keeps growing and growing as though it's reaching out for airborne pollen. But that makes them distinctive to see. Also, they don't have the yellow anthers. And uh, we have um, th these accessions with the high, intermediate, and low that, that have some say irrigating. And this uh, Sarah Ward publication here in 1998 describes the cytoplasmic inheritance with one of our accessions. Uh, the reason that male sterility is so interesting is that in many crops, it's been responsible for tremendous improvements in yield and productivity, especially in modern sunflowers and um, sorghum. They're a male sterile system, so the female plants have uh, been, uh, been crossed in a way that gets 100% male sterility in fertile plants. And then all the progeny, all the seeds collected from that male sterile plant, or the whole row, um, is F1 hybrid seeds, which has special vigor and other desirable traits. So this could happen in quinoa someday. And uh, that's why I try and keep track of it. But we have uh, these accessions with these traits. Oh, I forgot to say, this screen here is downloaded directly from our GRIN database, which is publicly available. And at the very end of this presentation, the, the URL is there. You can uh, search it from anywhere. And you can click on register now to start your account and request seeds, uh, especially if you're doing uh, research and development projects. Uh, we generally don't send to just uh, home grower garden folks, but for researchers. Um, so I, uh, I recommend this Ward paper. It's marvelous. And uh, this could be the next step for quinoa production. So these are the references, and uh, uh, this uh, Edelbar one at the top is the best and the most modern I could find explaining what a quinoa seed looks like and not mentioning the phonicle the way I see it, but using slightly different terms. The uh, Paul and Partet papers uh, describe those India uh, independent domestication quinopodiums and the Ward paper I just mentioned, and this is the URL for our uh, germplasm system where you can uh, search up our what we have. Uh, thank you. That's what I have. I hope you have questions. I plan to be here at the uh, symposium to answer questions after the presentation. And uh, thank you very much. Fantastic talk from David Brenner. I'm sorry I missed out on the first few minutes. Uh, una presentación fantástica de parte de David Brenner. Uh, lo siento mucho que me perdí los primeros minutos de la presentación. For some reason, my speakers stopped working. But... Por alguna razón, mi micrófono no estaba funcionando, pero... But so let's get into the, the questions for, for David Brenner. Uh, eh, vamos a ir a las preguntas que tienen para David Brenner. The first one is from uh, Daniel Bertero, and these are listed in the Q&A box. La primera es de Daniel Bertero, y esta está en la caja de preguntas y respuestas. And it's a two-part question, so I'll ask the first part first. Es una pregunta que tiene dos partes. Voy a hacer la primera parte. So it says, hello, David, soaking dormant wild quinoa seeds in hypochlorite and incubating them with high GA levels worked better for us than scarification. Did you try it? Okay. Hola, David. Remojar las semillas eh, dormidas o dorminantes de quinoa en hipoclorito e incubarlas con un nivel alto de GA bajo 20 a 30 grados centígrados funcionó mejor para nosotros eh, que hacer eh, escarificación. ¿Lo ha intentado usted? Uh, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I made a crude experiment with GA, uh, putting a little pile from a toothpick on the blotter paper, which I understand people have done with some other seeds. 
and uh, I turned away from that partly because we don't have a real laboratory here and I would have to delegate some of this work to my uh, college student hourly workers and there's a lot of uh, regulations about labs in this country where uh, it has the safety is very important so I was looking for something that uh, we could do with just David, ordinary. Could, could you give the translator a chance to, uh, to, uh, to translate in, in some segments? Yes, please. <laughs> well, uh, David was saying, uh, lo que David estaba, David estaba diciendo es que alguna vez él hizo ese experimento de remojar las, las semillas en hipoclorito e incubarlas eh, con un nivel alto de, de GA, eh, con papel seco, pero que en realidad no lo continuó haciendo porque él no puede estar en el laboratorio todo el tiempo. En el laboratorio trabajan estudiantes y lamentablemente oh, el, hay, hay regulaciones específicas para los laboratorios, entonces hay procedimientos que no se pueden llevar a cabo si, si lo están manejando los estudiantes. Yes, we needed a method that would not be regulated by the university here. Entonces necesitamos un método que no estuviera regulado por la universidad. So we actually have three more questions from Daniel Bertero, but we'll give someone else a turn. Bueno, tenemos otras tres preguntas de Daniel Bertero, pero le vamos a dar el turno a alguien más. Uh, at what temperature do you store your jars of seed? A qué temperatura? ¿A qué temperatura usted um, mantiene o guarda sus semillas? Our jars of seed are at three or four degrees centigrade. And the original seed is uh, much colder, at, uh, well below freezing. Bueno, las semillas que mantenemos en en los tarritos están entre 3 y 4 grados centígrados, pero las que están por fuera de, de estos tarritos van a estar a temperaturas más bajas, eh, temperaturas cerca de, de congelamiento. We plan to get a much colder uh, storage facility for the seed jars, so the seeds will last longer, but this is what we have now. Eh, nosotros estamos planeando tener un lugar donde podamos tener temperaturas más bajas para mantener las eh, semillas de, de los tarritos por más largo tiempo, pero por ahora eso es lo que tenemos. The humidity is controlled, which helps. El, lo bueno es que la humedad está controlada, entonces esto ayuda bastante. So we have one more question from Melsa Manjarres. Uh, it is in Spanish. Uh, Sonia, could you translate it? Give me just a second. Sure thing. I need to find, okay. So, tenemos una pregunta más de Elsa Manjarres. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I work with quinoa in Colombia and I find that the images that were presented were not C, or the type of C quinoa. Um, how can I identify a species as C, uh, Berlandiri or other species? Yeah, uh, Quinopodium taxonomy is difficult. El, la taxonomía del quinopodio es difícil. You will need a microscope and botanical reference materials. Usted va a necesitar un microscopio y materiales eh, botánicos. And it changes quickly. Scientists are describing and splitting species. So there is some chaos in the names. Y, y, y cambia muy rápidamente. Los científicos están continuamente um, seleccionando diferentes tipos y diferentes especies. Entonces está en cambio constante. You could start 
at a local herbarium and ask uh, botanists how to make these identifications. Usted puede empezar por ir a un jardín botánico y pedirle a, um, al, al cultivador que por favor le ayude a identificar las diferentes especies. There are distinctive shapes of the seeds. And Hay, the edge of the seeds, for example, is either pinched and narrow or broad and rounded. Hay diferentes um, formas de distinguir la semilla. Entonces, hay semillas un poco más grandes o más pequeñas o más gruesas o más delgadas. Okay. So we have time for one more question. Tenemos tiempo para una pregunta más. Um, and we'll go back to one from uh, Daniel Bertero. Y vamos a regresar a una de Daniel Bertero. Do you have any Himalayan accessions in the collection? Um, ¿Usted tiene alguna accesión Himalaya en su colección? Yes, I think Daniel wrote that just before I got to the slide that listed them. So we have those exactly. Oh, sí. Yo creo que Daniel lo escribió antes de que yo les mostrara la diapositiva. Sí, tenemos. Well, we've uh, reached the time for the Q&A. David, I really appreciate your presentation. Bueno, pues con esto terminamos nuestra sesión de preguntas y respuestas. Uh, David, agradecemos mucho su presentación. And I would uh, let everyone know that they can ask additional questions in Slack. Y me gustaría hacerles saber a todos que ustedes pueden hacer más preguntas en el canal de Slack. Just remember to use the at David Brenner uh, solo, handle. Sí, solo recuerden de utilizar el símbolo de arroba junto al nombre David Brenner para que para saber a quién va dirigida la pregunta. Everyone will be a Slack expert when we're done. Todos van a ser unos expertos en Slack cuando terminemos. Thank you very much. Thank you for including me. Muchas gracias a todos. Gracias por incluirme. So we will now transition to our second speaker, Rick Jelen. Nos vamos a ir a nuestro segundo uh, o nuestro siguiente presentador, Rick Jelen. And after his video, we will have a time for a question and answer period with him as well. Y después de su presentación, también vamos a tener un momento para uh, preguntas y respuestas que ustedes tengan para él. session. My name is Daniel Packer. I'm a research associate at Washington State University within the Sustainable Seed Systems Laboratory, and I will be facilitating this session. Today is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rick Jelen. Uh, Rick Jelen is a professor of plant genetics at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, USA. He has been working on chemogenetics for the past 20 years. Rick's areas of interest include the evolutionary history and domestication of chenopodium species, genome organization and species subgenome relationships, and the use of wild chenopodium for improving chemo's ability to grow in hot environments, including work with collaborators in tropical and subtropical countries around the world. With that introduction, we'll turn the time over to Dr. Jellen. I'm really pleased to be able to speak to you today at the International Quinoa Research Symposium. My name is Rick Jellen. I'm a professor at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. And I am going to be speaking today on the topic of genetic resources and breeding in uh, goosefoots, including quinoa. And my co-authors for this presentation are uh, David Jarvis, Jeff Mon, who are professors with me here at BYU, and then two students, Jake Taylor and Lauren Young, in our BYU Orphan Crops Lab. <clears throat> I'll be talking today about North American quinoa breeding gene pools, uh, North American crop weed complexes, uh, evidence we have for pre-domesticated pit seed goosefoot populations, um, some ideas on breeding outside of the box, some unconventional breeding strategies, 
for improving quinoa in North America and in the developing world outside of South America particularly, and also new information on um, diploids and their relationships to each other and to quinoa here in the Americas. Quinoa, to remind you, is part of a complex of tetraploids that are native to North and South America. These are 36 chromosome tetraploids that contain the A and the B subgenomes. They include uh, wild members of this complex, such as the various ecotypes of Kinopodium berlandieri. In North America, uh, the various wild uh, relatives of Kinopodium uh, hircinum in South America, and uh, various cultivated uh, members of this complex, including current uh, crops like quinoa in South America, Guazontle, Chia Roja in Mexico, which were domesticated independently in Mesoamerica in antiquity, and uh, even extinct domesticated uh, types like Kinopodium berlandieri subspecies Jonesiana, which was a grain crop as part of the ancient uh, Eastern North American crop complex and which went extinct uh, sometime after the introduction uh, or the arrival of the Mesoamerican maize bean squash complex uh, into Eastern North America around a uh, thousand or so years ago. This on the right here of this slide is a phylogenetic tree that we published in 2017 with the uh, genome of quinoa paper. And this phylogenetic tree illustrates the relationships between the A and the B genome diploids with this complex of tetraploids. Note that at the base of this tetraploid complex are the various ecotypes cultivated and um, wild of Kinopodium berlandieri. Um, then we have Kinopodium hircinum at the base of Kinopodium quinoa. Uh, this is a Kinopodium hircinum accession from Argentina. And then we have a Kinopodium hircinum accession from northern Chile that is interestingly at the base of a group of uh, cultivated quinoas or zaways from central and southern Chile. Um, the, so quinoa breeding resources in North America include the primary gene pool, secondary, and tertiary gene pools for improving quinoa. The primary gene pool includes quinoa. These are accessions of quinoa with which a quinoa variety could be easily crossed to produce completely fertile progeny. Um, for North American breeders, um, there are approximately 150 accessions of quinoa that are currently in the USDA National Plant Germplasm System collection. Uh, so a fairly limited pool in the primary gene pool. Uh, in the secondary gene pool, uh, this consists of Kinopodium berlandieri and other members of the uh, allotetraploid AABB complex uh, with which quinoa can readily be crossed to produce hybrids that are um, typically 5% to 100% uh, uh, fertile in the F1 generation, uh, depending upon the cross combination and depending upon the amount of heat stress on that hybrid. In addition, we have a tertiary gene pool that consists of mostly A genome diploids. There are over 34 described species of diploids in North America, uh, having the A genome, as well as two B genome diploid species. Only a small number of these diploids are available in the National Plant Germplasm System. I should note that we have an extensive collection of Berlandieri and tertiary gene pool diploids uh, from North America at BYU, and which we're happy to Per, uh, share with people, um, just contact us if you're interested. So uh, getting into my talk, uh, one of the questions that we had was 
a question that arose out of a study that, that Hugh Wilson and Manhart uh, published in 1993, where they were able to detect spontaneous gene flow from quinoa into pit seeded goosefoot growing around quinoa production fields in the late 1980s in Washington state. So we were asking the question where quinoa has been produced in the presence of pit seeded goosefoot in North America, in other places, is there also evidence that introgression has occurred from the wild species? And uh, one of those places that would be interesting to look at, we thought, is the quinoa. Uh, quinoa fields in the San Luis Valley in Southern Colorado, where quinoa has been produced for uh, approximately 40 years at 2,300 meters elevation. And we see some evidence potentially for outcrossing phenotypically, and we wanted to test that hypothesis of uh, introgression and formation of a crop weed complex, like we, the ones we see in around Titicaca in the Andes, for example, uh, is a similar thing happening where we produce quinoa in North America in the Colorado Rockies. So this slide is showing how we went about doing this experiment. We sampled 15 panicles that we selected. They were panicles having different and distinct morphologies from this field at White Mountain Farm. And they range from panicles that look like quinoa mimics that were black, for example, or purple, and others that were uh, truly wild looking in most respects or completely uh, having more widely spaced glomerules. <clears throat> and uh, photographing the seed that were taken from each one of those panicles, we can see that that seed color ranges from black to yellow to cream color to white, and that there's a wide range in different seed sizes among those 15 panicles. <clears throat> we then went ahead and extracted DNA from uh, plants grown out of the seed from each one of those 15 panicles. And we did an SSR, a microsatellite-based marker analysis, looking at just under 17,000 microsatellites that were called uh, as being polymorphic between BYU 1314 which is a Berlandieri from Southern Utah at a very, very similar environment and elevation as the San Luis Valley, except on the other side of the Colorado Plateau. And QQ74, which was our reference genome, both of these we had sequenced in the 2017 uh, paper in Nature. And this is showing the 18 chromosomes of quinoa uh, and uh, each one of these represents a different chromosome for a series of lines, including the 15 panicle selections from White Mountain Farm. And in each case, the 1314 uh, microsatellite allele at each locus is colored green, and the corresponding QQ74 locus is colored red in this diagram. We're just going to focus in on a small portion of chromosome 1A in the next slide, which is really representative of any region on any one of these 18 quinoa chromosomes. Here we have uh, this portion of chromosome 1A showing on the top line the, um, the B allele from Berlandieri, and on the bottom line, the A allele from QQ74. So at each particular locus, we have in QQ74, of course, the QQ74 or A allele, and at each particular locus in Berlandieri, we have the 1314 uh, allele or the B, and the Bs are colored green while the As are colored red. And so this provides an easy way to look at these. Uh, what we did is um, we went ahead and ranked these based upon percentage of SSR markers it, they shared, each line shared in common with Berlandieri 1314. So in decreasing order of similarity, we have Berlandieri 937, which shares over here in the far left column, 62% similarity with 1314, while Zontle from Mexico domesticated Berlandieri, which has 57% identity uh, similarity with Berlandieri 1314. 
And then we get into the uh, pa single panicle selections, one through 16, 14 is missing. Uh, and uh, what we see is a range from uh, line M6, which has 48% Berlandieri SSR markers, down to M15 at the opposite extreme, which carries still 13% uh, uh, markers from Berlandieri. And so we have a wide range of difference, which is indicative of introgression from Berlandieri into this, what has become a highly diverse population that is in, in fact a crop weed complex. And uh, uh, when we look at a uh, proportion of uh, Berlandieri 13, 14 SSRs in each one of these 15 lines, we see that there is a positive linear correlation uh, in, in, in terms of uh, panicle seed color and seed size phenotypes. Uh, plants that most closely resemble Berlandieri for panicle seed color and seed size tended to have the highest proportion of Berlandieri DNA. And so uh, this is exactly what we would expect if um, Hugh Wilson's hypothesis was correct, that we would be and that we should expect to be forming uh, crop weed complexes when we try and grow quinoa in regions where it cohabits with native Quinopodium berlandieri. This is just a representation of, again, uh, the relationship between phenotypic diversity for each one of these panicle selections and the percentage of pit-seeded goosefoot or Berlandieri DNA that they carry. Generally speaking, we see that the panicles that most closely resemble Berlandieri and generally speaking, the seeds that most closely, sorry, most closely resemble quinoa and have seeds that most closely resemble quinoa have tend to have the highest percentage of QQ74. DNA, while those that look the wildest tend to have the highest percentage of Berlandieri markers in them. Exactly what we would have expected if we have a crop weed complex. So how can we take advantage of these wild genetic resources like pit seeded goosefoot uh, to improve quinoa for production in North American and other warm season environments? And I'd like to propose a series of five breeding strategies that we ought to think about. Um, conventional wisdom would say, whenever we can, to try and stay within, entirely within the primary gene pool. But what if the amount of variation is insufficient? 150 lines are available in the National Plant Germplasm System, and that's it for improving North American quinoa within the primary gene pool. Also, what if that source germplasm for the primary gene pool originates from environments that are very different from the target production environments in North America, particularly for heat stress tolerance, but also potentially um, biotic stressors. Um, and what if there are, within that secondary gene pool, very close genetic relatives that are native and fully environmentally adapted to the target environments. So breeding strategy number one would say, let's take advantage of where we ha already have these crop weed complexes, and let's use mass selection to identify superior genotypes that have a broader range of adaptation. Um, in this case, we have, I've identified three of these 15 single panicle selections that produce big white seed that have a compact cultivated type panicle and uh, for all intents and purposes phenotypically are quinoa and yet they contain greater than 25 percent of their genetic markers are quinopodium berlandieri markers okay are there some benefits potentially from that cryptic linkage drug a second strategy would be to intentionally create quinoa by pit seed goosefoot breeding populations. And this is something that we are doing under a 
a recently awarded USDA NEFA grant at BYU where we're going to be making crosses between 10 uh, phenotypically desirable Kenopodium berlandieri parents having heat tolerance. Um, and those will each be crossed to QQ74, a real reselection, and 0654 to create uh, breeding populations that will then be distributed throughout the world to collaborators uh, on this particular grant. And uh, this photograph just shows some of the variation that we've seen segregating in these populations. These are F2 seeds in the three bottom rows showing a wide range of variation for seed size, seed coloration, um, uh, ability of uh, the um, pericarp to stick to the surface of the seed, et cetera. And so we're very excited about this particular project. Um, this is a slide that I just put into my talk for reference because this is going to be posted online. Um, this is just a reference for anybody that might be interested showing what we know currently about the different ecotypes within the secondary gene pool for quinoa breeding. These are ecotypes of Kenopodium berlandieri. And some of them are very, very interesting, and some of them are not very well characterized, as exemplified here with this ecotype by BYU 882, which has a very, very thick yellow-white pericarp. Um, interesting, and that requires some more work. Another thing that is interesting that we've been able to discover is uh, among the 250 or to 300 populations that we've collected, we've identified three of those populations, two from California and one from here in central Utah, uh, that include individual plants that have what I'm calling pre-domesticated seed characteristics an expanded seed margin with a flatter top and bottom of the seed, lighter seed color, and most importantly, a thinner seed coat with less, presumably less uh, seed dormancy. This might be very, very good material to begin um, wide crossing breeding programs with since they already possess some of the domesticated characters. A third breeding strategy is to use mutagenesis and I just put this slide in to refer you to the talk by my colleague David Jarvis here at this conference. A fourth breeding strategy would involve uh, point crosses between quinoas and A or B genome diploid wild relatives. Uh, this is a strategy that's been successfully used uh, in wheat breeding. Uh, to introduce particularly single gene uh, disease or insect resistant traits, uh, particularly from, um, from Triticum, uh, Triticum tauchii and uh, the D genome donor of bread wheat. And we, I think we could probably do the same thing in quinoa. One of the traits in the diploids that is especially interesting to me is the non adhering uh, utricle type pericarp that we find in a, uh, a series of diploids from throughout North and into South America, as exemplified here on the left with Kinopodium praetoricola, um, where we would potentially get around the problems associated with a strongly adhering pericarp in Kinoa and in Kinopodium berlandieri. Uh, we would have, in this case, the benefits of having saponin within the pericarp and yet have a pericarp that would be easily sloughed off of the seed in simple processing that would not require washing. Um, uh, the diploid kinopodium species are extremely diverse in terms of their origins and their, their ecological adaptations. And this is just showing a map of uh, my colleague Jeff Mon showed a similar map in his presentation. These are just locations of different groups of diploids that we have collected uh, over the years throughout North America. Um, one of the things that we've done with these diploids is we've, 
we've started a sequencing project where we've done um, sequencing to identify which of these diploids might be most closely related to the allotetraploid AABB Kinoa Berlandieri Hersinum complex. And uh, this is a phylogenetic tree that we recently uh, produced and uh, which Jeff Mon uh, showed in his presentation. And I'd just like to point out a couple of interesting things in this tree. Uh, we've highlighted here species uh, originating in South America in yellow, North American diploids in blue, and then uh, uh, in orange are Eurasian species, including here Chenopodium suasicum and Chenopodium physifolium. Over here on the left side of the tree are the bee genome and Eurasian origin uh, materials, which interestingly include two South American representatives a member of the Kenopodium album aggregate, which we assumed had been introduced into, into Argentina, and an Argentine species, native, Kenopodium obscurum. This could be evidence that the bee genome is present and is native to North, to North and South America. Uh, over here on the right side of the tree, we have a genome diploids, uh, and What's interesting is that we see amid the South American clade of diploids, Kenopodium albescens from South Texas, which seems to represent potentially a dispersal event, long range dispersal intercontinental from South America into North America. This is morphologically very similar albescens to Kenopodium ruiz leali, which is an Argentine native species. And similarly, on the bottom side, right side of the tree, among the agenome diploids from North America, we see Kenopodium papulosum from Argentina, which has a very similar morphology to the Kenopodium leptophyllum desiccatum group, and which likely represents a long range dispersal from North to South America. Um, a fifth breeding strategy is involving stepping away completely from quinoa and taking a look at the cultivated potential of uh, cultivated forms of Kenopodium album complex from Eurasia. There are two of these that continue to be grown in very isolated locations in the Himalayas, Kenopodium giganteum, and in Taiwan, Kenopodium formosanum, or Julis. Um, and these are interesting as crops because, because they contain the BBCC and DD genome being hexaploids with Kenopodium album, which is highly diverse, highly aggressive. Um, this could be an intriguing possibility to breed and develop a new crop at the hexaploid level um, using these materials. Uh, in closing, I'd just like to acknowledge and thank my colleagues uh, throughout the world, our colleagues here at BYU and throughout the world, and acknowledge the funding from the National Plant Germplasm System, Holmes Family Foundation, uh, KAUST, the McKnight Foundation, um, CONACYT, the International Atomic Energy Agency, um, and Ardent Mills. Uh, so with that, thank you very much. All right, fantastic. That was great, Rick. Muy bien, fantástico. Eso estuvo muy bien, Rick. So let's go ahead and, and start working on some questions. Bueno, pues vamos a empezar uh, con algunas preguntas. Are you ready, Rick? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Go for it. So we have one from Dylan Sarange. Uh, quinoa is predominantly a selfing species. Why do we observe introgression from wild species? Is it the reason that we still have much heterozygosity? Okay, tenemos una pregunta de Dylan Sarange. Y dice, la quinoa es predominantemente una especie eh, celosa podría decir, ¿por qué nosotros observamos introgresión de 
especies foráneas um, o especies no domesticadas. Eh, ¿Cuál es la razón por la que todavía tenemos tanta heterogeneidad? <laughs> Sorry, that was a long word. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, taking on the first part of that question, so quinoa is predominantly a selfing species. We've noticed that uh, particularly quinoa strains from higher elevations or quinoa strains that originate from very close to the very cool Chilean coast are heat sensitive. And in the presence of heat stress, uh, those quinoas are more susceptible to cross-pollination. Bueno, pues en realidad sí, observamos que eh, la quinoa es una planta que, um, no sé cómo lo traduciría, se fertiliza por, eh, y lo observamos en especies de diferentes lugares de, de Sudamérica, um, eh, que hay eh, esa introgresión de otras especies. Um, yeah, and then the other part of the question, um, I think that is uh, responsible for, or that's one reason why there's still um, appreciable amounts of heterozygosity in some quinoa lines. How, and why some people have had um, a very difficult time purifying quinoa, um, purifying uh, varieties of quinoa through, through isolation selection. It's very, very difficult to isolate quinoa when you're growing quinoa in the presence of other members of this tetraploid complex like Quinopodium berlandieri in North America, Rick, could you give the translator a, a yes, chance go ahead. To, to work on that? <laughs> Thank you. Well, and eso va en la segunda parte de, de la pregunta también que, que hacía. Um, esta es una de las razones por las que, por la que es tan difícil como separar la semilla de la quinoa y, y aislarla, porque como hay tantos componentes eh, y, y de otras semillas y todo eso, entonces es, es muy difícil como que poner simplemente la sola semillita de la quinoa. If, if we wanted to grow quinoa in, in the dry pampas in Argentina, I think we would need to expect that we would have passive outcrossing with quinopodium hircinum. Bueno, si nosotros quisiéramos cultivar quinoa, por ejemplo, en la pampa de la Argentina, debemos tener en cuenta que esa especie de quinoa va a estar cruzada con otras especies de quinopodium, um, se me olvidó el nombre. Oh, quinopodium hircinum. Thank you. Quinopodium hircinum. So we have another question that has been upvoted. Tenemos otra pregunta por la que votaron. So this is by Carl Schmidt. Esta pregunta es de Carl Schmidt. So great talk, Rick. You focused on adaptation as a favorable trait in gene pools two and three. Ah, uh, muy buena charla, Rick. Usted se enfocó en la adaptación como una forma favorable en eh, los genomas 2 y 3. Do you, do you also have evidence that seed nutritional qualities of the relatives may be better than in quinoa? ¿Usted tiene evidencia de que las semillas que están relacionadas con la quinoa pueden ser mejores? Thank you, Carl, uh, for your kind comment. Um, We don't have um, any evidence that nutritional quality of, of in the hybrids is better than in quinoa. 
no tenemos ninguna evidencia de que el, la calidad nutricional de los, de los híbridos sea mejor que el de la quinoa. But we do know that uh, from our hybrid derived lines, we do not have uh, detrimental effects on uh, nutritional qualities. Pero lo que sí sabemos es que no tenemos efectos detrimentes en la calidad de la semilla, aunque esté eh, mezclada con, con algo otra. And we also, Carl, we do know that within the wild, um, te, at least at the tetrapod level, within the secondary gene pool. Y, y además, eh, lo que sí sabemos es que dentro del segundo nivel, al menos en, dentro del segundo eh, nivel de genes, that uh, there is genetic variation for uh, traits like sweetness. Hay una variación genética para aspectos como el, el dulce. And uh, uh, waxy, um, amylose free. Um, seed. O por ejemplo, eh, como la serosidad de la semilla. So yeah, there are some interesting characteristics in this wild material. We just barely begun to scratch the surface to understand. Um, por supuesto, hay materiales interesantes dentro de este aspecto y nosotros apenas estamos empezando a, a descubrir y a estudiar todos ellos. So we have another question that has been upvoted. Tenemos otra pregunta por la que han votado. And it's by Thomas Davis. Y está hecha por Thomas Davis. Have you had success with the tetraploid by diploid crossing scheme? Ha tenido usted éxito con el tetraploid o el diploid para el cruce? If so, has aneuploidy been a factor in the progeny of the tri triploid by tetraploid crosses? Y si es así, ha el aneuploide sido un factor patogénico? en el triploid y tetraploid, en, la, en el cruce de triploides y tetraploides. Thanks, Tom. Um, we haven't tried making these crosses yet. Um, we are still focusing on primary by secondary gene pool crosses. Okay, gracias, uh, Tom. Nosotros no, en realidad no nos hemos enfocado en este tipo de cruces todavía. Nos hemos enfocado más en los cruces uh, primarios que se mencionaron. Um, we would, of course, we would definitely expect that there would be triploidy and possibly some aneuploidy in those uh, triploid hybrids. Por supuesto, nosotros esperamos que haya triploide y tetraploide en, en todos estos cruces. Well, I think we have time for one more question. Bueno, creo que tenemos tiempo para una pregunta más. From Dylan Sarange. Y esta pregunta es de Dylan Sarange. Can you please comment on heterosis in quinoa? Do you expect higher heterosis from quinoa by pit seed hybrids? Uh, ¿Puede por favor hablarnos de la heterosidad en la quinoa? ¿Usted espera una alta heterosidad eh, de la quinoa por procesos híbridos? Excellent question, Dylan. Um, yes. So where we see heterosis particularly in these hybrids. Muchas gracias por esta pregunta, Dylan. Nosotros vemos heterosidad en estos híbridos. Um, in the, um, especially for plant height, I have about, I have probably 15 or so, 16 uh, F1 hybrid plants growing right now down in the greenhouse. And they are, Um, at least half a meter taller than the um, than either one of the two parents. 
um, nosotros hemos visto esto y yo tengo eh, eh, un, un greenhouse eh, donde cultivamos entre 50 y 60 especies y vemos que algunas eh, son más altas que, que otras. The, the hybrids are all much larger than either parent. Los híbridos son más grandes que sus relativos. Seed size is larger. Um, see, there are dominant genes that are, that are controlling seed size in the hybrids. Hay genes eh, dominantes que están controlando el tamaño en los híbridos. Uh, the seed are black on those hybrids. La semilla es negra en estos híbridos. And when we use a pit seed goose foot, a berlandieri, or um, uh, a wild parent. Cuando utilizamos eh, este tipo de semillas berlandieri para eh, eh, especies silvestres. Uh, that contains trimethylamine, which is a fishy smelling compound. The hybrids smell like fish. Sí, contiene trimetropalamina, que es como un olor a pescado que le da a estas semillas. Entonces, eso huele como a pescado. But the, but the panicles are always more lax, like the wild parent. So I don't see um, immediate value in the F1 hybrid itself as a cultivated, as a, as a cultigen, but rather... Uh, derivatives through selfing and selection. Bueno, y entonces, um, sí hay una diferencia, pero yo no veo uh, una diferencia grande entre, can you remind me the last part? Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> sí, los híbridos mani ma manifestan una, la, la característica eh, en la panoja de de pariente silvestre y en el sentido que producen un, una panoja laxa y, y no compacta y entonces no veo no veo tanto tanto valor en los híbridos mismos sino en las líneas que seleccionamos y, y que um, autofecundizamos de esos híbridos hasta la generación F6, F7, F8. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to be more lab savvy to be able to translate that better. <laughs> Estaba dándole las gracias a Rick porque es un vocabulario especializado que es un poco difícil de traducir instantáneamente. Entonces, um, él me ayudó ahí. <laughs> Well, we'd like to thank uh, our speakers and our translators. Uh, Nos gustaría darle las gracias a nuestros presentadores y a los traductores. Uh, if you would like to follow up with either Rick or David, you can do so at Slack. Si ustedes quieren uh, seguir interactuando con Rick o David, pueden hacerlo en nuestro canal de Slack. I know I will. I had some questions I wanted to ask, but The Q&A does not work for me. Okay, yo sé que yo sí lo voy a hacer eh, porque tengo algunas preguntas para ellos y en realidad la, la cajita de preguntas y respuestas no funciona para mí. But uh, thanks everyone and uh, I hope you enjoy the next session after this one. Okay, les agradecemos a todos y esperamos que disfruten de la siguiente presentación después de esta. All right, thank you, Sonia. So this room is going to be closing. I'll keep the slide up for people to refer to to get them back to room one. Okay, muy bien, pues gracias a todos. Esta sala se va a cerrar, así que los invitamos a todos a que vayan a la sala número uno, donde vamos a tener eh, la última parte de en, en nuestra conferencia para el día de hoy.
Hello, this session will be closing in 10 minutes. Please make your way over to Quinoa Zoom Room 1 there at the tiny URL for the networking session from 3 to 4 p.m. Again, this room will be closing in 10 minutes. Thank you.
International Quinoa Symposium, Room 2 is currently closing. To continue the symposium and the networking hour, go to tinyurl.com backslash quinoa zoom room one. Thanks, we'll be reopened tomorrow.